Hi everyone, um, welcome to the Contemporary Women's Writing and Medical Humanities Conference. Um, it's a three-day international online conference. Um, so over the next three, three days, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, we'll be exploring research at the intersections of contemporary women's writing and the medical humanities across 21, 21 <laughs> parallel panels, four keynotes and two workshops. Uh, we have people joining us from all over the world, um, academics of all career stages across a wide variety of disciplines, as well as medical practitioners, artists, writers and journalists. Um, as our keynotes, we're delighted to have Amelina Demley, Javi Carell, Susan Stryker and Elliot Evans joining us. Thanks very much, everyone, for joining us. Uh, really excited to, to kick off this, this conference. So the conference stems from our uh, 2020 to 2021 13 part online seminar series for postgraduate and early career researchers, which was also called Contemporary Women's Writing and the Medical Humanities, which was organised with the support of the Centre for the Study of Contemporary Women's Writing and the Institute of Modern Languages Research, London. This week's conference is also supported uh, by the Centre for the Study of Contemporary Women's Writing and the Institute of Modern Languages Research London. We would like to thank our sponsors so much <clears throat> for their support and encouragement, and in particular, Shirley Jordan and Gadella Vice Sussex at the Centre for the Study of Contemporary Women's Writing, and Kathy Collins and Jenny Stubbs at the Institute uh, of Modern Languages Research. So following um, our, the successful online seminar series, uh, this international conference aims to continue the rich dialogue and research that have defied this, defined uh, the seminars thus far. So in this conference, um, we wanted to particularly encourage work on women, non-binary, trans, LGBTQI plus experiences. We seek to continue the seminar series aimed to explore how contemporary women's writing, be this fiction, non-fiction, poetry, biography, autobiography, life writing, philosophical, theoretical writing, comics, film, art, etc. Um, how it's, sorry, that was a very long kind of like parenthesis. I'll go back to the actual verb of the sentence. So all of that, to explore how contemporary women's writing and its forms currently engage with issues such as illness, disease, uh, healthcare, medical practice and clinical institutions. And just as a side note, I'm going to link in a sec the recordings to all the seminar series, as well as all of the other interesting series going on at the IMLR. So this conference is organised around several central uh, objectives. Firstly, it seeks to establish and expand upon a reservoir of key figures in contemporary women's writing whose work resonates with the medical humanities. This would include both well-known writers who may not have been considered in relation to medical humanities before, and also lesser known writers who demand more critical attention. In this way, the conference aims to showcase the diverse, interdisciplinary and intersectional ways in which contemporary women's writing engages with the medical humanities and explore how this engagement might transform the critical legacies already surrounding these writers. Secondly, the conference undertakes to underline and highlight the importance of the study of contemporary women's writing in relation to medical humanities research and in relation to medical research and practice more broadly. And finally, the event will showcase what healthcare and innovative medical thought can do for contemporary intersectional feminisms and highlight the role of contemporary women's writing in challenging imbalances in power and representation in medical discourses and practices. Okay. And now for some Zoom uh, house rules. So sessions will be recorded and uploaded to the IMLR, IMLR website. Um, please feel free to turn your cameras off or on, whichever you feel is most comfortable. Whilst um, most of the speakers have given express permission for recordings to take place, we would like to remind you that anyone in the audience automatically agrees to the recording when they join the session. Um, in each of the parallel panels, there will be uh, three or four 15 minute papers and then a Q&A session. If you could all remain on mute too until the Q&A session, this would be appreciated. And just to be clear, it will be a full run through of the papers and the Q&A right at the end. Um, during the Q&A, if you'd like to ask a question, question, please feel free to use the raise hand option on Zoom. This is when you click on participants and then a window pops up on the right with all the names in the current Zoom call. And then you'll see that there are some options um, underneath where you can raise, uh, you can click on your name, find your name first, click on it, and then it'll have the raise hand option. Um, you can also type your questions sort of uh, during uh, during the um, papers, you know, as inspiration comes to you by typing question into the chat box followed by your question. 
um, and then the moderator, the chair of the given panel or keynote will come to those questions in addition to the ones that kind of happen during the Q&A itself. Um, if you're not comfortable with voicing your own question, uh, write this in the chat box function because then the moderator chair can read it out for you. Um, and that's it, it's Ben's turn now. So yeah, we'll be providing audio description for all of the sessions. Uh, so we would kindly ask all speakers to audio describe themselves and any visuals in their presentations as much as is possible. For the captioning, there is a button at the bottom of the screen uh, labeled CC, which you can use to add uh, auto captions to this seminar. So with this in mind, Becky and I will now introduce and audio describe ourselves. So my name is Benjamin Dalton, and I'm a researcher in uh, French studies and the medical humanities. Currently, I am looking at conceptions of hospital and clinical space in contemporary French philosophy and cu cultural production. My PhD thesis, which I completed last year, was on the philosophy of the contemporary French philosopher Catherine Malibu and her concept of plasticity. I currently teach at Nanterre University and the New Sorbonne U University in Paris. So I'll just audio describe myself. I'm a 30-year-old white man. I've got a um, brown hair and brown beard and today I'm wearing kind of beige um, shirt with little kind of leaf, a leaf pattern all over it. And I'll pass over to Becky. Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks Ben. And I'll, um, I'll briefly audio, audio, um, audio describe the, uh, the slide that we've got on. So we've got the slide with the title of the conference, our names, the email address, which I'll put in the chat at the end of this intro. So you can, if you have any queries, you can contact us there. Then we've got a background of kind of like blue, orange, pink kind of cell picture, cell art. Um, for my um, kind of introduction, I'm a sort of final year part-time PhD student in French studies at King's College London, also looking, um, working in the kind of realm of illness narratives, um, looking at four Frank contemporary Francophone writers and their autofictions of despair and suicidal ideation. Um, my sort of auto description is I'm a also, you don't have to give your age, by the way, we're just doing it. I don't know why, because we've had our 30th birthdays this year. I'm a 30 year old uh, white British woman with gold glasses and plaits and a kind of Hawaiian shirt. Um, and that's it, I think. Um, some brief things that I'll just add in the chat again. Um, I'll add our email address. Any questions, queries, tech issues, um, you can send them to our email address, which will be here. Um, and um, what's going to happen now, we finished a little bit early, so if you have any questions or queries, you can put them in the chat now. Otherwise, um, this panel, well, this Zoom call is going to stay open, I believe, for panel A, so panel 1A. Um, so we have three, no, sorry, four Zoom, you should have four Zoom links in the email from the IMLR, A, B, C, D, and they correspond to the panels 1A, 2A, 3A, all in A, B, C, and then we have a fourth parallel panel um, on the Saturday, I believe, uh, Friday, sorry. Um, all of the keynotes will also be running through the, um, the A panel link too, and all of these like little um, workshops and like intros and conclusions and things to the conference will also be running through Zoom link A. And don't worry, we'll be kind of reminding people about this and you know doing a lot of reminders on Twitter and stuff like that. And you can also email us if you have any questions. Um, yeah, I think that's it for the moment. Um, if you want to go to panels 1B or C, you can leave this call and then join those. They'll be kind of, um, or a bit early, so you've got a bit of time. They start at 9.30 um, UK time. So you've got a bit of time there to go get a cup of tea or something and then join those. Otherwise, if you want to stay for 1A, you feel free to stay in this call. Um, but yeah, you can also just like go and have rest or what have you. Yeah, I think I think that's everything. Okay, so I think I'll start with some um, basic housekeeping. So welcome everyone to this online event supported by the Center for the Study of Contemporary Women's Writing and the Institute of uh, Modern Language Languages Research. Uh, my name is Lucia Lopez. I am a graduate research fellow at the University of Salamanca. Um, and I am a 27 year old uh, white woman from Spain. I have long brown hair and I'm currently wearing glasses and a jean jacket. Um, so as you all know, this is panel 1A, 
called Feminism, Femininity and Illness. And today we have uh, four wonderful speakers that are each going to present for about 15 minutes after a brief introduction. Um, and then we'll have the Q&A session at the end. Whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Thank you. I'm just going to share my screen quickly. Perfect. Um, yeah, so um, I'm just going to describe myself quickly. Um, I'm a 25 year old uh, white woman and I've got long brown hair and I'm wearing a gay black top. Um, and as you heard, my thesis is on self care. And so before we dive into Atessa Moshevig's text, I just wanted to quickly contextualize the kind of self care I'm interested in. Um, because it's a really slippery and vast thing. And I find that kind of whenever I mention self-care to people, they either grin or wince. And I'm internally doing a little bit of both all the time. Um, and so I just wanted to lay the groundwork for that before we get stuck into the novel. So for the purposes of my work, I define self-care as the undertaking of a specific project with the goal of soothing or sustaining the self during a period of perceived crisis. Um, and the specificity I think is really important here, um, because as much as self-care is abstract and slippery, it's really easy to get lost in this labyrinth where everything is self-care and we don't really have a clear sense of what it is and what it is trying to do. Um, and the self-care I'm interested in is also really period specific. Um, it refers specifically to the spike in interest in self-care we see uh, following the election of Donald Trump in 2016, there's this kind of wave online of interest in practicing self-care and self-care guides. And as is the nature of the internet, the second that we see this wave, we see the backlash of people decrying the de-radicalization of self-care and kind of reminding us that Audre Lorde called it political warfare and it shouldn't be used as a marketing tool. And I think this maps really fascinatingly onto discussions um, emerging on kind of conflicting feminisms in the wake of the 2016 election and the critiques of the Clinton campaign as corporate white and imperial and the sense in radical communities and among feminists of colour in particular that things like the Women's March advanced a version of feminism with little interest in the structural struggles of women of colour. Um, and so we see self-care emerge as a point of tension in discussions about flippancy and seriousness because the allegation here is that the version of self-care being advanced online in response to the election is much in the same way as this kind of white feminism, neoliberal, myopic and frivolous. And this is absolutely true. But what I'm interested in is when what happens when we allow ourselves to think and feel ambivalently about self-care. And we have scholars like Timothy Aubrey and Trish Travis in Rethinking Therapeutic Culture reminding us that these facets of society and these kinds of cultural phenomena are most interesting when we understand them as emerging from pain and that the, the incessant cynicism of critique can occlude what's most interesting about them. Um, so rather than turning to my primary texts as an avenue through which to critique contemporary self-care, I'm interested in how they embrace and play through its ambivalences. And this is where Moshfeg's novel comes in. Um, I think my year of rest and relaxation is a really apt place to begin and a really helpful crystallization of these discussions. It makes vi visible a lot of these ambivalences. Um, Moshveg's unnamed protagonist is white and wealthy and entitled, but she is at a true crisis point. And her self-care project is ludicrous and it's only possible because of her financial and structural privilege, but it is life-saving. So the novel works both as a cutting satire and an invitation to tread more carefully. From the outset, I think Moshfeg incites conflicted and ambivalent feelings about her narrator's self-care project by virtue of the novel's setting. It's set in New York City in the year preceding the attacks on 9-11, and the novel follows its recently orphaned narrator's attempt to hibernate um, with the help of prescription medication. The centrality of VHS tapes to the narrator's sleep and the cyclicality implicit in her constant playing and rewinding inflect the novel with this repetitive rhythm. Meanwhile, the world around her hurtles through the years 2000 and 2001, and the reader is made to feel acutely aware of the conflict between the narrator's apathy and the speed with which the Manhattan outside of her apartment is approaching September 11th. This pull between the microcosmic documentation of the narrator's movements, medications, and attempts to sleep, and the enormity of what awaits is central to the novel's ambivalence towards her self-care project, because she's static, and that static is simultaneously frustrating and precious in light of what we know. 
The millennial setting of the novel also serves to situate the text at this curious generic intersection between the psychopharmacological memoir and the pop culture of the ubiquitous Manhattan dramedy. By unpacking the push and pull between the profound and the flippant, Moshfeg invites us to think ambivalently about self-care and its cultural history. So I wanted to start with the psychopharmacological memoir because I think it's the novel's most obvious generic nod. Um, in its first person confessional form and through the positioning of medication as the answer to the narrator's depressive state, it's reminiscent of the depression memoir genre of the kind of 1990s and 2000s. The title itself and the repeated use of the phrase my year of rest and relaxation throughout the text makes this connection obvious. Um, and the quote I've got up on the slide comes right at the end of the first chapter. I knew in my heart this was perhaps the only thing my heart knew back then, that when I'd slept enough, I'd be OK. I'd be renewed, reborn. I would be a whole new person. I could start over without regrets, bolstered by the bliss and serenity that I would have accumulated in my year of rest and relaxation. So we see the narration here leaning into the conventions of the self-help memoir, the pre the, this preoccupation with refashioning the self and this retrospective narration, implying that there is a kind of renewed and reborn narrator on the other side of this text. Um, so these generic gestures alongside the prevalence of prescription medication situate the novel alongside commercially successful women's memoirs with similar preoccupations like um, Elizabeth Wurzel's Prozac Nation and Lawrence Slater's Prozac Diary, both of which are pictured on the slide. These works draw a great deal of attention to the prevalence of antidepressants in contemporary American life, and in particular to the heavily gendered nature of Prozac. There's a lot of feminist scholarship kind of at the time and since expressing concerns that works like this do promote Prozac as a kind of an answer to existential anxiety. Um, and that antidepressant medication is used as a salve for the conditions of neoliberalism, enabling women to manage both corporate life and care and responsibilities and thereby fulfill the neoliberal imperative to have it all. And whilst Prozac itself is conspicuously absent in Moshfeg's novel, the critique of the pharmaceutical industry is very much there in the form of the narrator's wildly eccentric psychiatrist, Dr. Tuttle. Tuttle's name itself, I think, is curiously evocative of the rattling of a pill bottle. And despite her eccentricity, she exemplifies the dubious ethics of the pharmaceutical industry, constantly dispensing samples alongside very astute advice on how to manipulate insurance companies. She's both a form of choric relief and a sobering reminder of the industry that profits from feeding the narrator's reckless hibernation habit. One of the drugs Tuttle liberally prescribes is the fictional infirmiterol, which the um, Tuttle assures the narrator wipes out existential anxiety better than Prozac. They're described as small and pellet shaped with the letter I etched into each one, very white, very hard, strangely heavy, which is a curious description because it, we might apply that to the narrator herself. Infamiterol is simultaneously the most successful of the drugs and the most problematic. While it allows the narrator to black out for these extended lengths of time, she wakes having done things she doesn't remember doing, leaving the house, making extravagant purchases, partying with former art world acquaintances. She purchases flowers and clothes for her best friend's mother's funeral, which her conscious self has no intention of attending. So these strange little fictional pills um, appear to give life to a different self of the, to, for the narrator, someone who socializes and takes care of herself and others. So through infamiterol, Moshveg makes legible the latent anxiety in the psychopharmacological memoir that the pills may well, may well work, but whose standard of well-being do they enable the taker to fulfill? This pull between the parodic and the earnest is fundamental to the other generic facet of the novel, um, the Manhattan dramedy. Um, I borrow the term from feminist critic Alison Winch's work on sex in the city and post-feminist media, because the novel's pre-9-11 Manhattan setting is deeply entrenched in the trappings of this particular pop cultural moment. Um, and nowhere is this more legible than in the character of Reva, who embodies the post-feminist subject Winch theorizes. So in her exploration of shows like Sex and the City, um, Winch explores um, kind of what she calls girlfriend media, arguing that these shows draw on liberal feminist rhetoric, but fundamentally speak the commercialized language of neoliberal post-feminism. Reva stands for self-care at its glossiest. She's the embodiment of this. She sports this encyclopedic knowledge of fashion, pop culture, and self-help advice, and sex in the city. She's described as a slave to vanity and status, and she's constantly in the process of regurgitating advice from magazines and self-help books with titles as pointedly ridiculous as Get the Most Out of Your Day, Ladies, and 
how to attract the man of your dreams using self-hypnosis. The narrator's vividly acerbic descriptions of Reva are inflected with particular derision towards her self-help projects. Her advice is delivered as though she were reading from a bad made-for-TV movie script, and I think the illusion there is quite deliberate. Simultaneously, Reva's reality is at odds with the reality she, with the advice she readily dispenses. Her mother's dying of cancer, she's in a relationship with her married boss, and she suffers from both an eating disorder and alcoholism. Through the narrator's descriptions of Reva, um, we might be invited to laugh at her, but the novel itself takes care to point out the tragedy of Reva's situation, reminding us that her attempted self-care projects are rooted in genuine crisis and a direct result of mainstream cultural pressures. So can we really balk at the absurdity of the narrator's self-care project when its mainstream counterpart is equally toxic and dangerous? After all, Moshfeg's narrator's self-care project appears, albeit temporarily, to work. If we compare the quote on the left from very early in the novel to that on the right from its penultimate chapter, we see a shift in the style of prose. Our post-hibernation narrator is, it has a drastically different relationship with her surroundings and senses. The world is no longer garish and hostile. It's lush and inviting and worth existing in. Reva, meanwhile, becomes a victim of the attacks on the World Trade Center on September 11th, 2001. Despite the narrator's change in perspective, she finds herself stuck on this moment, replaying the footage of a woman she believes is Reva falling from one of the towers incessantly. This footage replaces the narrator's films as her self-soothing mechanism, complicating the narrator's apparent catharsis by locking her in her former habits. There's a wealth more to be said about Moshfeg's choice of September 11th as an ambiguous denouement, um, and I'm still not entirely sure what to make of it. Um, but what I think it does most poignantly is point to the central impossibility of the solipsism of self-care. The point is no longer whether the self-care project has worked or not, because the world outside the narrator's apartment defies recovery. And yet something in her has changed. The final words of the novel about the falling woman on the footage sound quite unlike the narrator we have come to know. I am overcome by awe because she's beautiful. There she is, a human being diving into the unknown, and she is wide awake. By deftly leaving us with this tension and this uncertainty, and this sense that the change in the narrator is both profound and, fr and frivolous in really slippery and challenging ways, Moshfeg makes contemporary self-care's contradictions impossible and tangible. And crucially, by sidestepping straightforward satire and offering something disorientingly earnest in this ambiguous closing moment, she challenges us to sit with them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Georgia. That was brilliant. I'm sure there will be uh, a lot of questions for you afterwards. Uh, I'm sure I have lots. Um, so uh, the next speaker that we have today is um, Stephanie Barnes, uh, who has recently completed her MA in Literature and Culture at the University of Salford. Her main research interests are representations of abject femininity in 21st century women's writing. Stephanie currently works in adult social care for a local authority, which is in itself a constant source of sociopolitical inspiration. And she can neither confirm nor deny that she herself is herself an abject woman. Uh, so her paper today is titled Poor Rich Girls, The Medicalization of Femininity Under Capitalism. Uh, so Stephanie, whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Thank you. I'll just share my screen. And then just to audio describe myself. So I am a 28 year old woman, I'm white British, I have brown hair and I'm wearing brown glasses and a striped t-shirt. Um, so first of all, just to give a bit of background, um, this paper was initially written as part of my MA um, where I was looking more closely at the relationship between work in its many nuanced forms, including paid employment and emotional labour, um, forms of work which are critically and fundamentally gender coded. I've continued to revisit and rework this paper um, 
so often and it's formed the basis of my PhD um, where my research speaks more to the aesthetics and ethics of menstruation and representations of bleeding under the umbrella of the medicalization of femininity under capitalism. Um, so it asks if capitalism is the only viable option and waged work is the only strategy for being acknowledged and acknowledging yourself as fully human, the refusal to work becomes a central concept of subversive resistance. Well, Tessa Moshfegg's My Year of Rest and Relaxation, Helly Butler's The New Me, and Lucy Bridge's Sad Janet offer contemporary reflections on these perceived and alleged modes of female antagonism. Moshfegg's portrayal of the self-medicated refusal of the unnamed narrator stands alongside Butler's depiction of Millie's hopeless reluctance and inability to obtain permanent employment, whilst Britch's Janet has a conscious and self-imposed relegation to a dog shelter on the outskirts of civilization. So Fisher proposed that work and life become inseparable under neoliberalism. Work is pivotal in the formation of the self, and for Fisher, the precariousness of work is central to the precariousness of self, manifesting in mental illness, depressive hedonia, and reflexive impotence. So whilst Fisher's reflexive impotence speaks of individualised experiences of mental illness, these texts, I feel, speak to the performance of femininity under capitalism. The unnamed narrator exists on inherited wealth, and Millie can fall back on her middle class parents, and Janet too speaks the same coded language of money. So I ask, does the extrapolation of these protagonists from the various modes of work, so not employment alone, female work, self-care, um, duties of care, emotional labour and performance of femininity, and their perceived resistance render them detached from any meaningful social feminine identity? This paper considers the site and labour of the home as the traditional basis for female identity construction, the role of alienation, the impacts of class consciousness and representations of hedonia as protest, as bound in society's long-standing propensity for mental health diagnoses for allegedly unwilling women. So I've broken down what I consider to be kind of the key themes of the three texts. This is not by any means an exhaustive kind of breakdown of the themes. So the labour of the home as a source of identity is a long contested key component of feminist debate and the production and consumption of housework holds within itself a dichotomy of ordeal or pride. Um, housework is formulated around the prescriptions and prescriptions to community, but also alienation and separateness. Um, so today, even thinking beyond the literature, to look at the world of like, the vast and confusing world of cleaning influencers, trad wives, different kind of social media led elements of femininity and cleaning. So in understanding that labour turned the home itself into a locus of suffering and trauma, Millie's home is presented as a locale of despair and disorder. Millie tells us, I pace my apartment, my prison, my home. If I had unlimited energy, I would do laundry, or if I had quarters. Maybe I'm an embarrassment, I'm not sure. The sink sludge in the bathroom is the last to go. I grab the Comet powdered bleach and the organic enzyme-based drain cleaner and jump right on in. My first sweat in ages. The mold on the drain stopper is smooth, thick and black. Academically, Penny draws a parallel uh, she states, we labour at great emotional cost to gild our cages, our increasing resentment tempered by fear of the social consequences of refusal, a fear which is engendered in us by patriarchal capitalism. The setting of the home reflects on this long-standing patriarchal society, whereby the female locale is strictly monitored and the home as the female realm aligns femininity with domesticity and still rejects anything outside of this as dangerous. And Butler emphasises Millie's branded and organic consumer choices, um, 
which I feel demonstrates on the surface she's inextricably engaged with the capitalist system. But on a deeper level, Millie is invested in the marriage of self and home, in reading the neglect of the home as an extension of the neglect of self. Millie demonstrates the far-reaching impacts of neoliberal capitalism beyond the boundaries of employment and work. Here, if the female power of refusal is the most single most scary, most horrifying, most insistently phobic thing facing any society ever, there is a certain duality in refusal. The refusal to engage with the home extends therefore to the self and to broader scopes of capitalism, meaning that all of the elements of refusal become intricately bound. And this is a prevailing sentiment whereby not being able to keep the one's home clean still suggests a complete breakdown, especially for a woman. And power continues to lament that the current sorted young woman image is rather conveniently the sort of worker best suited to all types of jobs on offer. But it doesn't mean that in a few years' time, women won't go back to being depicted as deranged Jezebels hell-bent on fucking society up. This dichotomy underlines the three texts, emphasising that today there's no middle ground for this medicalization of femininity, and there's likely to be no middle ground in the future. And Moshfeg considers the multifaceted nature of identity construction within the same parameters of home. Um, she tells us, her unnamed narrator tells us, I could make a case for my mother's rejection of domesticity as some kind of feminist assertion of her right to leisure, but I actually think that she refused to cook and clean because she felt that doing so would cement her failure as a beauty queen. Highlighting the engagement with unpaid labours of housework can be read as a refusal to restrict female identity. Um, so beautiful, wealthy white women do not need to prescribe to the same tenets of homemaking femininity, and their rejection of this is not needed to be explained away by the individual experiences of mental illness. And I think in a contemporary fashion, this speaks massively to carceral feminism and looking at kind of the handing over of blame or the reassigning of political kind of resentment or political responsibility. So as Fisher considers the capitalist realism denies any possibility of a social causation, mental illness belongs to the individual and the roots of cause of mental illness is within the individual. So the overarching power of alienation is present in all three texts, and this courses through all aspects of contemporary life, underpinning the women's relationships with work, others, and self. Central to my paper is the understanding that if alienation is a far better concept for understanding the common emotional experiences of life under capitalism than anything in the American Psychiatric Association's Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, one must consider loneliness and isolation as powerful figureheads of contemporary female rejection. Moshfeg, Butler and Bridge present women who are alienated either through their own volitional circumstances prescribed and enforced by wider societal norms. If there is no alternative to capitalism and all conduct is read as economic conduct, experiencing yourself as a commodity alienates you from yourself. This alienation can be read through the text, and in all of the texts, alienation from the self is sought and achieved through the consumption of real and invented pharmaceuticals or alcohol consumption. This self-alienation self can be read as antagonism through the prescribed alienation. So it's a choice rather than a socially inflicted isolation. The women respectively recognise the limitations of their political, patriarchal and economic spheres and their refusal to engage allows them to alienate themselves rather than being subjected to alienation. Um, so it allows them to establish their own narratives of control. And I think, as Georgia said, it's so um, conflicting in that all three of the women are from relatively if not extremely privileged backgrounds so this act of refusal is afforded to them 
um, which makes me question, would it be afforded to women from a different background? Um, so Butler frequently draws upon the position of Millie as an outsider. Millie is not only extraneous to the world of full-time contracted employment and workplace relationships, she's alienated from the social strata of the office, describing the lives and concerns of her co-workers and the day-to-day -day minutiae of life as a symphony of bullshit. Millie's social isolation is the underpinning of this refusal to conform. And Millie says, what's the point? I would have been alone no matter what. In recognising others' ritualised performances of care, Millie shuns the emotional labour to embrace her own alienation. She again says, you can't ask someone to help you without letting them know you're different than advertised, that you're uglier, weaker, more basic, less interesting than promised. It's better to be alone, better this way, better to be able to be yourself with yourself, openly awful, who cares? nobody. Self-commodification is an all-encompassing in the respective protagonists examine their worth as individuals. Self-commodification unites the protagonists in their same moments of alienation. And the crosswires of alienation, labour, capitalism and female experiences of mental illness have recently garnered popular public attention through the conservat conservatorship of Britney Spears. Um, so personal kind of aside, so I was 14 um, when I first read Jane Eyre, The Yellow Wallpaper, The Bell Jar, Girl Interrupted. I had a, a complete summer for these very specific novels. It was the same year that Britney shaved her hair and endured a highly publicised breakdown. And my research has been hugely influenced by the compounding elements of fractured subjectivity, worth, alienation, and gendered illness. In her 1999 hit, Britney sings, her loneliness is killing me, reinforcing that short experiences of union reinforce that each of us is, for once and for all, a single person, alone in a body, known only to the self. One could say that the development of social identity is then bound in our human relationships. The world of work and workers' formation of identity fails to address the depth and breadth of our lived experience, lyrics which speak directly to balance cruel optimism. So despite her crippling loneliness, Brittany is still invested in her fantasy of successful relationships. If the misery of being exploited by capitalists is nothing compared to the misery of not being exploited at all, alienation becomes the root of suffering. A life without suffering is seen as frivolous and meaningless. It becomes necessary to determine if refusal needs to be bound in suffering or crisis. And alienation extends from labour to all aspects of life. So the refusal to work in its many forms is a self-alienation and a prescribed rejection of a perceived meaningful social feminine identity. So most interestingly, Bridge Janet forgoes antidepressants, opting for an internalised bogeyman. And she explains that all the tiny sadnesses will build up into you until they make you into whatever monster you are that really keeps you up at night. For Janet, the cruelties of lived reality become their own transformative crises. The consciousness of feeling is therefore the crux of humanity and personhood. Meaning is found in feeling rather than social identity. Bridge poses the question, if poverty, inequality or isolation, i.e. the tenants of neoliberal capitalism, make us feel sad, is sleeping through the night and smiling over dinner any kind of permanent solution? In conclusion, where capitalism stands to be the only viable economic option, a meaningful social identity can feel to be bound in employment, work as meaning is fraught with issues and will inevitably generate further discussion. I've selected three texts which foreground the experience of wealthy, white, heteronormative women, and I, volumes could be written on those who are outside of these groups in the many, many forms that they are. So one is drawn to consider the potential dangers in not locating meaningful social identity or locating the identity in female mental illness. Uh, so for me, it's pertinent to ask if meaning cannot be located in work and if women choose to resist, 
where might female alienation lead? Who stands to profit from the medicalization of femininity and who will pay the price? Thank you. Thank you so much, <laughs> Stephanie, that was brilliant. Um, I think there's a, a lot of potential for conversation between your paper and yours, and I'm looking forward to see you uh, speaking to each other at the end. Um, for now, we have our next, our next speaker, um, Yasmin Mortasabi. Um, Yasmin, I don't know if you're, oh yeah, there you are. Uh, she is currently completing a master's in arts, literatures and languages at, I'm going to butcher this so much, uh, L'Ecole des Etudes and Sciences Sociales, uh, where her research has taken on a literary and anthropological approach. Uh, last year, she completed a master's degree in history and literature at Columbia University in Paris. Um, previously, she received a bachelor's degree in media, culture, and communication and French for, from NYU. Um, her research centers around contemporary women's narratives in which anorexia is a theme and inner speech and self-fragmentation as they relate to the experience of anorexia. So her paper today is titled Rewriting Experiences with Anorexia, Contemporary French Women's Autobiographical Narratives. So thank you, Jasmine, whenever you're ready. Great. Um, okay, yes, so I'm going to auto-describe. I'm Jasmine, I'm a woman in my mid-20s. I have brown curlyish hair and uh, with reddish highlights and uh, I'm wearing a black shirt today. So I'm going to be talking about narratives that recount an experience with anorexia. Uh, and before jumping into that, I'm going to contextualize this type of literature. Leading up to the 21st century, uh, more and more people were becoming interested in anorexia, so much so that it's been called the illness or even the epidemic of the century. Whether or not we can call it the illness of the century, uh, the heightened interest in it is undeniable. Marianne Groulet says that this happened through writing rather than through images. So on the one hand, we have discourses that were proliferating, discourses on anorexia and literary texts that were proliferating. These discourses were no longer restricted to the medical field uh, and they attest to, uh, and but, oh my goodness, sorry. Um, but they don't make it any less confusing than it was before. Uh, they propose a multitude of sometimes conflicting explanations uh, for the illness, attesting to an inability to satisfactorily explain the phenomenon, so much so that it has been called an epidemic of signification. In terms of literary texts, uh, these are written by people personally affected by anorexia. Isabel Murray, in her book, Writing Size Zero, says that uh, the sample of text she analyzes points to the difficult, not to say impossible task of defining anorexia. Literature by nature is open to a multiplicity of interpretations and in this way it reflects anorexia itself. It's an effective way to study anorexia because uh, it doesn't point to one cause or one interpretation of the illness instead of leaving it open-ended. Of course, literature containing themes of anorexia and hunger existed before the 21st century. Two examples of this are Victorian era literature and literature depicting male hunger artists as protagonists. But these authors and characters have not explicitly been uh, categorized as anorexia and if, as anorexics, and if they have, it has only been done so retrospectively. Contemporary literature, uh, representing experiences with anorexia is almost exclusively produced by women and most often depicts women. The first autobiographical text to recount anorexia from the anorexic person's point of view in France was written by Valerie Valère, who was 16 years old at the time that it was published, which was 1978. It's a testimony called Le Pavillon des Enfants Fou, the word for crazy children, and it has turned her into a familiar figure in discussions about anorexia and paved the way for other accounts um, like this. Its impact has been 
impact, uh, amplified by her suicide in 1982. Today, I'm going to be focusing on two books, um, Genevieve Brizac's Petite, which was published in 1994, and Delphine de Vigan's Jour Sans Fin, Days Without Hunger, uh, published in 2001, originally under the pseudonym Lou Delvig, and then later under her own name. Petite recounts the entire arc of the protagonist Nukes anorexia with a focus on its onset. And Jour Sans Fin, um, starts with the protagonist's lore being on the verge of death, and then it recounts her ho hospitalization and recovery. The reason why I chose these books are because they are two of the first to follow Valère's, and so they helped form the foundation of this uh, new subgenre of autobiographical writing. But at the same time, they are still very relevant and influential today. A new edition of Petite was uh, published earlier this year by the original editor, Edition de l'Olivier, and Jour Sans Fin was adapted into a play late last year, and it's currently running until Saturday in Avignon. What I'm going to show today is how these protagonists anorexia fit into a peri the period of their lives that's described in these books, and I'm going to argue that story consumption and production play a large role in their anorexia. Before moving forward with the anal analysis, I would like to point out that even though anorexia is uh, heavily featured in these books, we can't reduce these texts to their representations of the illness. Uh, as Delphine de Villon says in an interview, I would like to, for Jules Enfant to be more than just a story about anorexia. I would like for it to also be read as a book about the passage to adulthood, about the very desire to live. And uh, just to say, all my translations, uh, all the English translations are my own. Um, additionally, Petite, uh, the reason why it was first studied was because of its autobiographical nature. The first secondary source to talk about it is from 1997. It's a published high school handbook by Antoine Jurga and Jean-Christophe Planche. And they say that uh, it was published at a time when this genre autobiography was flourishing. And it was only later on that researchers became interested in this text because of its focus on anorexia. Uh, also at its, uh, the word anorexia is not mentioned in Petit until about halfway through the book. At the onset of her illness, Nuke doesn't even know what anorexia is. She thinks it's something she's discovered. She says, what makes it interesting is that I'm the only person in the world to have had this idea. Throughout the book, she invents a series of games to feel less lonely and anorexia is described like, her anorexia is described like one of these games. She eliminates foods, measures her thighs and she weighs herself every day. And she compares these activities to a game she creates when she's buying school supplies. She says, I invented a game that resembles my other little tricks with the tape measure or the scale. I buy something other than what I wrote ahead of time and if possible, less expensive. This rather complicated undertaking opens up a door, something that resembles freedom. Exactly like secretly losing weight, like having decided to renounce the life of others, their food. So with her eating disorder and the games that she creates, she feels like she found a way out of the life of others that she's been struggling with. The girls at school don't ask her to hang out with them and she feels a lot of pressure from her parents who she feels are never satisfied. She soon starts vomiting and in the same way that she categorizes her school supplies into two columns, one for the product and one for the price, she separates her foods into good and bad foods. Good foods that she chooses and bad foods that are imposed upon her and that she vomits. She also feels like her life has been separated into two, her real life with her books and her official life where she does what is uh, expected of her. The books um, play a large role in her life and in her anorexia. And I'm going to focus on the role of one book in particular in her recovery. And this book is Solzhenitsyn's One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich. She's hesitant to read the book because she's worried that it will ruin the image of Russia that she has uh, created in her head from the books that she read in high school. And uh, in a way, giving up this image to read the book uh, symbolizes her giving up the world that she's become isolated in through her illness. Her world is filled with books, uh, 
And interestingly, throughout the narration, there are fairy tale references that are integrated and she would show that she really imagines her life in this way. When she has a visitor uh, during the brief period that she's hospitalized, uh, it's an actor that her mom works it with. She imagines him to be her Prince Charming. And when she smothers her, baby little, her little baby sister with um, sweets, she simultaneously sees herself as the good fairy and the wicked witch. Sacrificing her perfect storybook world allows her to start facing and to accept the world as it truly is. Uh, the final, she reads the final passage of the Solzhenitsyn book over and over, realizing that sometimes books help you more than anything else. After this, she starts reconnecting with others, and uh, this happens through writing and through books. Her initial exchange with the person who becomes her boyfriend happens through a written exchange. She sends him a note, and then she starts visiting her grandpa, and uh, he tells her stories, and later on she brings him books, providing reading material of her own, which is what Brizak herself does with Petite. She offers a book that can help others, especially people struggling with anorexia, the way that the Soldier Teen book helped uh, Nuke. Moving on to Jour Sans Fin, a big theme in this book is lore being caught in between. So she starts off being caught in between her two parents, and this is uh, reflected by her experience with anorexia. The book also emphasizes the recovery stage of the illness and how tough this path is, not because of Lore's unwillingness to get better, but because of how difficult it is for her to give up the only way that she has come to feel safe. Uh, the reader sees that her parents are a big factor fueling her suffering that has become translated into anorexia. In the beginning, she feels just one thing. She wanted to hurt them and throw her wasted body in their faces like an insult. Both of them are toxic. We learn that her parents are divorced and that they're alcoholics. Um, Amelina Domle points out that the way that her parents use words lie in stark contrast to each other. Her dad is constantly spewing out hateful monologues while her mom barely says anything. Her dad's words are described like food. They're difficult to digest. Catherine Robson sees this as a form of force feeding, which is the opposite of what her mom does. She does not consistently offer nourishing food. In one remarkable scene, she serves Laura and her sister Louise frozen raspberries that are still frozen um, for dinner. And so the two of them are caught in between their parents who are opposites in these ways. The hospital that Laura stays at is also an in-between zone. When she starts connecting with the other anorexic patients, she sees that one relapse after she leaves the hospital and she sees another one spent her 30th birthday in the hospital and this really discourages her from remaining locked up in her illness. At the same time, she's created a community and a new life with them and it, this fills the void that has been left by her parents and it's hard for her to give that up. And she recognizes this. She is caught in between, she knows it. In between an illness she can't fully give up yet and a tomorrow that she can't yet foresee. In order to help her with this, the doctor who treats her tells her stories and this in addition to uh, the support from the other patients gives her courage. Then uh, she talks about Lenore who Robson sees as her anorexic alter ego who forms a self form of self-splitting. Uh, she's the one who encourages her to stay anorexic and in this way she's not only caught in between, but also split in two. Uh, Lenore convinces her to cheat her way out of the hospital uh, by emptying her feeding tube at night and tying a bag of rice around her waist so that she'll appear to be heavier than she actually is. And when she leaves the hospital, she leaves it in this in-between stage, uh, not fully having given up control yet, but also recovered enough so that she feels ready to leave, and which she proves by sticking to the meal plan she is given. Now I want to talk a little bit about the paratext of these books, which seems to put anorexia on display in a way that the texts themselves do not do. In the original cover of Jour Sans Fin, we see in big letters, Roman d'une anorexie, a novel about anorexia. And in the first few editions of Petite, we see uh, mentions of the word anorexia or anorexic, um, and the bold, I've done that. Um, to highlight that. 
Druga and Planche say that highlighting the illness is a way to market for the editors to market their product, which is their book. And in this way, it kind of puts, uh, and it makes anorexia a selling point. Uh, but later editions of Petite, so the 1996 edition doesn't have it, have the anorexia or anorexic. I noticed recently that the two, a one 2005 edition does have it, but instead of highlighting the illness, it seems to use it to highlight her recovery because the moment she hears the word for the first time, uh, she calls this her, uh, her life buoy. So it's like a life-saving moment. And then as we, oh, and then this is the most recent edition, which does not have it at all. And then as we saw earlier, here is uh, Delphine de Vigan's new, uh, the Jour Sans Fin's new book cover, which does not have the uh, Roman d'une anorexie. It's just a silhouette of a girl. These, um, one reason why uh, mentions of anorexia were, um, deleted off the paratext might be because um, representations, book and movie representations of the illness have recently been criticized for glamorizing the illness. There is something called reading disorders that has been pointing it out, which is people who are anorexic or on the verge of becoming anorexic um, who use these texts as a way to reinforce their illness. But as we saw, books can also be a way uh, for anorexic people to help themselves and move beyond their illness. Uh, so just to conclude, um, because of an inability to cope with or feel like they belong in the world, Nuke and Lore isolate themselves in their own worlds, whether it be a perfect storybook world or the safety of a hospital. Recovery entails them giving up their idea of their ideal world and finding a way to integrate into reality and the world of others and accepting who they are, not in the sense of uh, of them liking themselves, but accepting their in inevitable uh, passage into adulthood and uh, also more specifically womanhood. Uh, narrative exchanges, communication, and feeling like they had a support system is key. Um, and the last thing that I want to highlight is that them convincing themselves to uh, give up their ideal world to recover is similar to them convincing themselves to remain anorexic. In anorexia, there's inevitably some degree of imagination and inventiveness that allows them to perceive themselves as the opposite of what they actually, actually are, so overweight if they're not, and for them to believe that certain foods are safe and others are not. Uh, and ultimately, these two texts show that it is possible to recover, providing hope for the potential anorexic reader and uh, people around them. Thank you. Thank you so much, so much, Jasmine. That was fascinating. Um, so finally, uh, our last speaker for the day is Katie Goss who is a funded doctoral candidate in the School of English and Drama in the Queen, at Queen Mary University of London. Their dissertation focuses on the concept of plasticity as articulated in the work of philosopher Catherine Malabou and how its potential alliance with feminism provides a means to understand emerging trends in women's artistic production. The research interests lie in material embodiment and its capacity for transformation, particularly in convergences between the arts, humanities, and neuroepigenetic and ecological sciences. Their work has been published in Porn Studies Journal, and they have recently co-organized a conference called Queer Feminist Ecocriticism in Live Art and Visual Cultures, and co-edited a collection of essays queer feminist decolonial ecologist dossier. So their paper today, which is the last for this panel uh, before the Q&A session is titled, Don't Try to Think Too Much, The Emotional Brain and Feminine Aesthetics of Cerebrality, which sounds fascinating. So Katie, whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lucia, um, for the chairing and your great introductions. It's really great to be here. 
um, auto description. I'm a white British non-binary person with long browny blondy hair wearing a kind of patterned shirt. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. There we are. Okay, um, so for my paper today, I'm going to give uh, first a brief outline of Catherine Malibu's work between neurobiology and philosophy, suggesting ways in which her concept of cerebrality undermines determinist binary logics and regimes of control, and thus holds significance for feminist engagements with contemporary subjectivity, social life, affect, and embodiment. I'll offer some thoughts on how Otessa Moshfei's novel and the disaffected state of rest and relaxation it centers upon delivers an aesthetic mediation on the possibility for the estrangement of the self to its own affects. In this, I'll suggest how this apparent insensibility can actually be understood as a new schema for subjective vulnerability and thus linked to further trends for disaffected femininities as a means of locating alternative structures of feeling, disrupting dominant binaries between cognition and sensuality mind and body, self and substance, creation and destruction. Um, oops. Uh, so to begin, for those who are not already familiar with her work, Catherine Malibu is a French philosopher who is the contemporary thinker of plasticity, a term she first locates in Hegel, but which also emerges in contemporary scientific discourse on neurobiological embodiment. Most simply put, Plasticity designates the capacity to both give and receive form, offering a non-deterministic schema for understanding how matter, including the biological matter of which we are composed, is inherently changeable and open to forms of transformation rather than fixed, stable or deterministic. Plasticity has had a particularly profound impact in the neurosciences, which now accepts that the brain is thoroughly plastic continually changing throughout life, shaping us, and also being shaped through experience. While this plasticity undermines analogy of the brain as a computer, which hardwires, encodes, or dictates cognition, Malibu's first philosophical intervention in neuroscience, uh, What Should We Do With Our Brain, the first book there, um, contests the way that many neuroscientific accounts assimilate this radical material transformability to capitalist models of obedience. She critiques the neuronal ideology that asserts you are your brain, and which thereby encourages us to deploy its flexibility in accordance with societal demands. Malibu insists that the neuronal revolution has, quote, revolutionized nothing when our new brains serve only to displace ourselves better, work better, feel better, or obey better. Um, in her following texts, The Ontology of the Accident, The New Wounded, and Self and Emotional Life, Malibu explores the significance of neurobiology not as merely flexible to the demands of capitalism, or indeed any form of optimization, but that which is recalcitrant, resistant, and explosive. Thus aligning with feminist approaches to corporeality, Malibuian plasticity is not an infinite polymorphism, it is rather a means of attending to the specific limitations or forms of difference, fragility and resistance ingrained in the nature of embodiment. Um, so Malibu turns to the forms of being exhibited by those who have suffered neuronal trauma and brain injuries, um, such forms that are accounted for in popular texts, such as Oliver Sacks's The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat, and which she personally experienced in her own grandmother's Alzheimer's. She suggests that in these cases, we see that even the defamation of neural matter is a form of creation, that the neurological injury or trauma, in a certain sense, invents its subject. Thus making the new wounded of universal significance, Malibu ontologizes rather than exceptionalizes this experience. Those who, in being remade by their neurobiology, are severed from their psychic history and altered, sometimes entirely beyond recognition, reveal that the plasticity of embodiment does not only inhere in a positive capacity, which always reinforces self-identity. Um, there isn't time today to do full justice to the richness of Malibu's concept of cerebrality, but to put it most simply, cerebrality refers to the reciprocal link between the life of the brain and subjective experience, a secret economy of affect, 
in which the possibility of the strangeness or estrangement of self to its own affect is originally inscribed in the neuronal system. Privileging and complexifying aspects of neurobiological life that are otherwise marginalized or indeed castrated or pathologized, Malibu shows that the affective disturbances seen in the new wounded are in fact the paradigm for all brain beings. Instead of a brain purely devoted to logical cognitive processes, the libidinal economy of the emotional brain is sensuous and psychosomatic, that which both feels and generates affect and feeling. So receiving information from the world outside and within the body, the dynamic processual becoming of the plastic brain generates feeling in the very movement of psychosomatic totality. Emotion is a process at work in the regulation of life rather than the expression of an inner unity or specific affect or passion. It is the means by which the neural system manages the foreignness of the inside to itself. And in this is raised the possibility for a dyssynchrony or a dislocation between the feeling of oneself and the feeling of oneself existing. We are not the same as our brain. To say we are our brain would imply ascribing a constancy to the unrepresentable effective flux that it is. So cerebrality denotes this libidinal economy which enables disaffection. The necessary gap between the subject and its neuronal composition can be glimpsed in forms of dislocation and disturbance which relay this irreducible foreignness of the self to self. Um, turning now to a Tessa Mosh phase, my year of rest and relaxation. I'm very fortunate to follow Georgia and Stephanie's amazing close readings and will limit my own introduction to the novel and simply say that Moshfei's writing savagely undercuts the evocation of indulgence, peace or pursuit of pleasure, transforming the pleasingly alliterative refrain of rest and relaxation into a drastic and strange form of being, a corporeal state of inertia conveyed through a narrative voice which is almost entirely disaffected. Initially, the narrator states dispassionately, I just wanted some downers to drown out my thoughts and judgment. I thought life would be more tolerable if my brain was slower to condemn the world around me. So this unsympathetic narrator's retreat into sleep is explicitly characterized as an attempt to escape the unruly sensitivity of the neurobiological body, to erase her own emotional life and the suffering it makes possible in regards to her own psychic history into subjectivity and the force of socio-cultural events. None of it affected me, she describes. This was the beauty of sleep. Reality detached itself and appeared in my mind as casually as a movie or a dream. Um, as we've already heard, Moshfei's novel is particularly attuned to the effective disposition of contemporary life and subjective composition by biopower. While scorning beauty treatments and self-help books, the narrator nonetheless displays a deep investment in idealized models of transformation. Sleep felt productive. The lurid variety of some pharmaceuticals which littered the narrative speaks to what Paul Preciado calls the pharmacopornographic era, in which psychic life is assimilated to a neurochemical self. Yet, I think that this attachment to fluid, malleable corporality as infinitely flexible and open to improvement is itself a form of undoing. The cruelty of the narrator's optimistic investment in pharmacological reinvention emerges through a psychosomatic state of dissociation, one which forecloses the ability to make sense of her own wounds and thus appears to overshadow and obscure the very psychic and social traumas she is attempting to shed. I felt nothing, she says. I couldn't bring them up in me, couldn't even locate where my emotions came from. My brain, it made no sense. Irritation was what I knew best. A vibration in my neck, like my head was revving up before it would rocket off my body. But that seemed directly tied to my nervous system, a physiological response. Was sadness the same kind of thing? Was joy, was longing, was love? So here I would suggest that Moshfei's narrator appears post-traumatic to the extent that what she grapples with is not simply psychic repression, a total absence of emotion or a complete disembodiment, but a kind of overstimulated numbness, an inability to feel her own feelings and a psychosomatic state described as on the verge of a kind of explosive dismemberment. 
So as well as giving a commentary on the impoverishment of intersubjective and social life in an atomized hyper neoliberal society, where this deadened individual slips so kind of seamlessly into a world already rife with disconnection, mutual exploitation and superficiality. I think Moshfei's text actually does something really fascinating in giving a kind of exposition of this form of self-estrangement. This is not just the absence of emotion, but an exposure to the kind of strangeness of the neurobiological body underlying this very capacity to become disaffected. Bored, immoral, and only interested in escaping into the oblivion of sleep, the narrator celebrates growing less and less attached to life. Yet, as the social world, her own psychic history, and even her dreams become faded by disaffected blankness, the apparent retreat into inertia actually brings the narrator closer to another kind of unconscious process. The carefree tranquility of sleep gave way to a startling subliminal rebellion. I began to do things while I was unconscious. Swallowed up by sedation, the irritability of her neurobiological corporeality continues to disturb itself with strange signs of activity. Suddenly awaking to the world anew, sometimes in unfamiliar places, the narrator is confronted with rearranged furniture, new clothes, freshly waxed limbs and painted nails, chapped room histories of erotic exchanges with distant strangers. In this way, the narrator's totalizing impulses towards her own subjectivity run aground on the forms of affect which have not been consciously experienced, whether slick panties, which suggest being recently aroused, or the flecks of plain glitter clinging to the inside of her throat, the material residues of past moods, modifications, and interactions do not appear as a symptomatic expression of an inner repressed desire or fantasy, nor are they purely a mindless action or mechanistic reflex. These affects without a subject display a thoughtfulness and a sensuality in terms of libidinous embeddedness, exposure, and susceptibility to social worlds. So rather than disappearing and reappearing renewed and whole, Moshfe depicts a subjective transformation as enabled by, but thus also somehow limited to, attachment to form. Even when trying to stop thinking, experiencing, and feeling, the narrator's refrain of, I am not affected, is then given over to affects which exist in her place and which demand to be read. The form of this estrangement of the self from herself is not the absence of feeling, but of the subject feeling the feeling. The strangeness of the non-subjective neurobiological activity underlying this disaffection thus renews and regenerates questions of affective economies and nervous systems in which we are embedded shaped by biopolitical violence and neoliberal discourse, but also by the agency of neurobiology, which shapes and remakes us without our intent or consent. Um, so the formative role of sleeping pills in this literary text situates cerebral life as a new frontier for contemporary feminist and writerly interrogations of sociopolitical and biopolitical violence and the forms of subjectivity which suffer it. I want to suggest that the failure to achieve total inertia that Moshfei shows suggests, as Malibu does, that the embrained body actually contains forms of resistance, materially disrupting demands for infinite flexibility and regimes which individualize and thus suppress collective trauma. Indeed, there can be no protective accumulation of bliss and serenity. Undercutting narratives of self-reflexive reinvention where we take authorship of life's trajectory, like the plot of a novel, the cerebral self is not a story the self tells itself, but that which solicits itself without seeing itself. Disrupting persistent binaries between thinking and feeling, mind and body, construction and deformation, the narrator's irritability suggests a logical sensuous mode, not a subject as a kind of dematerialized surface, like a Deleuzean body without organs, but whose own effective economy situates a constant subjective vulnerability in the synthesis of different states of relation between brain, body, and world. While impossible to escape, the neurobiological body is destructible and knows itself to be so. For Malibu, the libidinal economy that cerebrality situates is, quote, a biologico-symbolic knowledge of fragility, 
in the brain's capacity to experience the altering character of contact with itself, end quote. At the novel's end, having re-emerged from confinement, seemingly renewed, the narrator buys a new VHS player to record the news footage of 9-11. She describes watching and re-watching a woman who could be her friend Reva falling over and over again. The effect of this traumatic event thus does not come through a kind of conscious disclosure of emotion, but a disaffected compulsive mode she describes as soothing. In this final image, we see that even those who do not appear to experience their own suffering, nonetheless show how deeply entrenched emotional life is to the extent that its defamation or disruption does not put an end to psychic life, but transforms it in unanticipated ways, enabling the kinds of disturbances which saturate the world, the contemporary world, and echo the vacancy or senselessness of its meaning, the overstimulated numbness, detachment, apathy, indifference, and flat affects attendant to a new age of political violence. Um, I think I've run out of time now, but there are many other literary examples of these kind of unsympathetic, disaffected femininities, which do not conform to the rosy and overly optimistic picture of embodiment and social relations, uh, often presented by my mainstream neuroscientific and cultural discourse. Um, by posing the question of what it is, feels like to feel nothing at all, uh, I think writers allow us to take on the absence of the other and attend to this kind of fragility and irreducible strangeness of corporeal kind of cerebral life in contemporary nervous systems. Thank you so much. Sorry, thank you so much, uh, Katie. So we have um, around 20 minutes uh, for some questions from the audience. So to give people some time to um, think about what they, they want to ask um, or speakers, I would like to uh, just draw some uh, conclusions or uh, some thoughts that have come to mind while um, I was listening to this amazing presentation. So I, I, I guess the first one would be that um, we have all found uh, a year of rest and relaxation, a fascinating, fascinating read. Um, I know I did when I read the book, which was uh, now some months ago, uh, but I think it speaks uh, highly of the book that uh, we have had um, three very complex uh, close readings uh, that have um, expanded on, on different points from uh, the same narrative um, and I think that's fascinating and I would like to encourage uh, those of you who have engaged uh, with the book to talk to to one another if we have time because I think uh, there's a lot of uh, potential for for great idea development um, in that conversation but sort to uh, sort of like to bring uh, just me and also into the the fold of the conversation I have um, a couple of questions um for you uh um that um maybe other people uh, can be interested in so um i think one of the topics that um are common to all the presentation is the notion of resistance throughout uh different acts um and i, I don't know if uh, you touch specifically on this on your presentation and i think it's also a very controversial reading of um, anorexia or um, different um, eating disorders as acts of resistance or refusal uh, to contemporary society. Is this something that um, you see on, on the books you have touched upon or are they more focused on the recovery aspect and how is this um, portrayed uh, as in uh, recovery, is it a reconciliation with neoliberal society and um, in which ways is that represented? Um, do you think you can expand on that a little bit? Um, so in relation to society, there are moments where it seems like they are resisting, uh, maybe not society in general, but more um, 
how other people have defined anorexia as it being um, like an effect of society and of our culture, for example, um, models and things like that. And there are moments where they say that, no, it's, it's not because of that. So Delphine de Vigan says it, my anorexia didn't start or not her anorexia, but the protagonist didn't start with the summer diet that I did with my friend. It had nothing to do with that. And the other one, she says it had nothing to do with magazines and nothing to do with Twiggy. Um, so in a way that's kind of resisting. And then in terms of recovery, reconciliation, yeah, I, I guess it's reconciliation with, or maybe conciliation for the first time, because I maybe they never were integrated into uh, the world around them before. And that this was kind of their, uh, the, what they had to go through or something that they unfortunately went through in growing up. Okay, thank you. So we have uh, some questions from the audience. Um, I don't know if uh, Amalina or Catherine uh, went first. So uh, Catherine, if you are ready, uh, you can start. So there you go. <laughs> thank you. Um, I'll just get that done. Um, so yeah, um, I was interested in, I, and I thought, this might be a way to sort of ask all the panelists at once. Um, but um, Jasmine, I was really interested in the point you were making about um, how in Petite um, it has the, the fairy tales running through and this idea of she didn't want to read Solzhenitsyn because she didn't want to destroy her concept that she had of Russia or the, the Soviet Union. Um, and I think I kind of, I'm interested in this idea of how, because I think, if I'm right, all of the books that have been spoken about are to some degree autobiographical. So there is this sense that it isn't fiction, but it's maybe it's a partially fictionalized account. Um, but I wonder how, how books and Solzhenitsyn is a fictional account, but it's a fictional account of the gulag you know the the work camps in soviet union and um i wonder how these may maybe semi-fictionalizing or you know accounts of true events true life stories um and in particular i think georgia you really spoke about how to deal with this september the 11th conclusion and how can we come to grips with that and what is you know, why does she, because actually that one, no, oh no, that one wasn't autobiographical, was it? I've just realised. Yeah, okay. So how fiction or, you know, fictionalising of these true events and blending this fiction, how we can sort of undo the happy ending, undo the fairy tale. And so, you know, that dealing with these kinds of issues like um, anorexia or, you know, this medication you know, this numbing from the real world. I realise I don't really have a question here, but I'm sort of sorry. I've just, uh, I just, I just thought it was really interesting to pick out from, from obviously Jasmine, you weren't talking about the, the same novel, but how those sort of across those, the works that you've discussed, um, what we can say about this unsettling of the fairy tale, this unsettling of the happy ending. Sorry, that was very rambly. Let's say Georgia first. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I think, yeah, it's really difficult because I think Voschweg's novel kind of defies structure to begin with. And so it's kind of, it's quite difficult to grasp how she might break from a structure that she doesn't adhere to in the first place. Um, but one of the things I was thinking about as you were speaking, is um, there's an interview um, where Boschweg is discussing the novel and is kind of discussing these um, kind of fugue states essentially that um, the character goes into when she's on Infamitarol. Um, and she was asked about them and she said, well, I incorporated them because it was it's a first person narrative and you can't write a novel that's just like Monday, 
went to sleep, you know. Um, and so, yeah, I guess if we're thinking about kind of the settling of a happy ending and the undoing of it, there's something... I don't know, I think there's something really poignant in that sense that she's grasping, I don't know, I don't know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> um, I think there is very much a sense that she makes it look like the end of a, of a mental health memoir and then that gets kind of unraveled, but I, I would argue not quite unraveled. And I think the the kind of what is truly unsettling about Mosh Fegg's narrator is that she does remain a little bit changed. It's not like there's an illusion of change and then that is completely undone. There's the sense that she's continuing to adhere to um, these compulsive patterns of watching and rewatching and this self-soothing that is very much characteristic of her narration throughout the novel. Um, but there is there is a shift in perspective there that makes us not quite be able to settle um, on whether this project has worked essentially. Um, so yeah. So Jasmine, do you want to add something to the? Um, I think that it was a fairy tale elements uh, that uh, Catherine was wondering about. Yes, absolutely. Um, so yeah, so the fairy tale it goes on throughout the whole illness so at the onset and in, in the middle at some point she says that her perfect system where she has her good and her bad foods that it all just uh, kind of gets disrupted because then all the foods are bad foods and she talks about her rivers of vomit mixing but the way that she describes it does not sound very graphic it sounds very much like a fairy tale and something that would happen in a fairy tale. So I think that even for her, her fairy tale world stopped working completely. And so that kind of allowed her to uh, move out of it, to undo it, like you said. Thank you so much, uh, Jasmine. So uh, Amalina, if you uh, would like to um, pose your question now. Thank you. Thanks, Lucia. Um, I wanted to, I mean, I've got a question for, for Jasmine and um, one also for Katie. Um, my question for Jasmine um, is, is about this idea of reading disorders, um, which you touched upon at, at, um, towards the end of, of your paper. And you were talking about the reading disorder, I think, within the context of the paratext. It was really interesting to hear about, about those changing paratexts. Um, and of course, you know, you were thinking Thinking there about how um, the paratext had, had had been altered in order to increase, perhaps to increase the the book's marketability, marketability, but also to reduce the sense that that these were books that might appeal to um, to young people who might be or young people or, or otherwise who who might be looking for you know, tips, perhaps, um, and. I mean, I was really interested in this idea of, of, of the reading disorder, which seems to be quite multi-layered in a sense, because, because there is this idea that you that, that, that you um, raise that um, in both books, there is a sense that reading participates in recovery, that reading books, writing are... Um, are in some way offering um, the protagonist something which allows them to, to, to move beyond their disorder. But then at the same time, I wonder if it's not the case that in both texts that reading appears to offer some kind of form of sustenance um, that, that, that often comes in as a kind of kind of like a rival or, or even like a substitute for food. And I wondered if you wanted to just perhaps elaborate a little bit on this idea of the reading disorder and whether it takes on sort of multiple meanings in, in the two texts. Um, and I, I don't know whether it's better for me to leave that there and, and, and let Jasmine respond and then ask my question to, to Katie afterwards. I think I'll do that. Okay, yes, thank you for that question. You are absolutely right, yeah. It, um, I think we could say that maybe they have reading disorders too, but in a different way in that, for example, Nuke, when she first starts, um, she, well, when she first 
becomes anorexic, she looks at diet guides and she looks at, uh, I think, maybe one other thing. And so that kind of, it's still reading material that fuels her um, reading eating disorder, but it's not uh, obviously something that's specifically about eating disorders. And I think that's also a reflection of the time because these books didn't exist when she was anorexic uh, a few decades ago, even longer than that. I think it was in the 80s. Um, and then, uh, yes, so the way that they describe reading is definitely, it often is kind of like the way that eating is described. So when they're both in the hospital at some point, so Lore, she can't even, she can't eat and she also can't read, but she's taking in stories from other people. And it seems like that she first takes in stories before she's able to start reading again because it's too much. It's as if she's being fed too much. And then the same with Nuke, once she starts feeling a bit better, she says that she reads thick books that she hopes will make her gain weight. Yeah, thank you. It's, it's, it's absolutely, sorry, I've got a child in the background making a bit of noise. Apologies for that. Can you cut it down? Um, it's, it's, it's so fascinating, isn't it? Because there's that kind of that sense that, that, that the reading provides some kind of, some kind of sustenance, um, some, which, which can replace food in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Jasmine. That was, that was really interesting. Um, and Katie, I wanted to ask, I was really intrigued by the idea you came to at the end um, where you were talking about unsympathetic, um, disaffected femininities. What does it feel like to feel nothing at all? And, and you suggested in, you know, from your reading of this particular work, but then sort of thinking more broadly to the rest of your research, that, that, um, that there is a possibility that they're in for a kind of openness to the other. Um, I think that's what you said, and that's how you expressed it. Um, and I was, I was interested to know whether you feel that um, Malibu's work um, on disaffection can offer us a different way of thinking about empathy. Um, because, the, you know, the sort of the conventional models of empathy, of course, rest upon, you know, an, um, a sort of... Um, certain possibility for affect. Um, so what happens when we're talking about the disaffected subject um, or the unsympathetic disaffected um, feminine subject? Does it offer us a different way of thinking about, you know, openness to the other, a different way of mediating um, empathy or, or is it something altogether um, completely new? Thank you so much. That is a really good question. Um, I think uh, where to start? I think what's really interesting is um, a lot of feminist work on the kind of uh, kind of interrogating neurobiology. One of the big points of contention is the kind of work on mirror neurons that happens and the way that we often see these discourses of empathy as this kind of like it's like this biological substrata we just do it like I see you picking up a cup and I feel like it could be me picking up that cup and it kind of makes us appear very transparent and empathy is very automatic when in fact we know that of course we live in a world where there's all kinds of misrecognition and failures of empathy and neuroscientific research tends to look away from these kinds of things um, and I think Malibu's like privileging of the new wounded is definitely like a provocation to think about um, like the ethics of empathy, um, especially I think a point that's particularly interesting is this idea that if in the kind of traumatic event, the subject disappears, they're not really a stranger to themselves. They're actually a stranger to people around them. It's actually by this kind of the other that we see these people as like strangers um, or unfamiliar. So I think that there's something actually really complex in that she does with empathy and thinking about where we assume empathy is when it isn't. Um, you know, are we actually kind of cutting off the person in front of us by always deferring them back to the person we expect to see there? Um, is that a kind of failure of empathy? You know, when we talk to somebody with dementia and keep asking them, who are you, who are you? 
are we actually doing something incredibly cruel when we could, rather than constantly trying to put them back in the place that we think they should be in order to empathise with them, we're actually doing something like really unjust to the kind of what is there in, in place of who we kind of desire to be there. Um, so yeah, I think it, it, it's complex um, and certainly not like an overly optimistic idea of, of our ability to understand what it's like to be another person. Um, but I do also think it's a provocation in terms of like asking us to empathize with people that might otherwise seem quite unsympathetic or themselves kind of absent of the emotion that we kind of want uh, from other people. Um, and I think there's some really interesting work uh, like Zion Yao's book on disaffection in like 19th century writing, where she really talks about like kind of disaffected subjects as people often racialized or feminized or kind of queer subjects as having these kind of alternative structures of feeling that actually escape the policing of emotion in these kind of sentimentalizing kind of ways of thinking about self and other. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> um, so maybe um, we have a space for one more question. Um, I know there are a couple more in the chat, but just to, to um, allow Stephanie to speak a little bit, um, maybe, um, we could um, try to answer um, Alison's question. So she says, um, I would like to ask those who have worked with my year of rest and relaxation, what do you make of the role of art in both the narrator's illness and recovery? She briefly touches upon her failure as an artist and treats art with a sort of reverence throughout the novel. Does her role as a subject of Think she's art installation also play a part in her recovery, as does her hibernation. So, um, Stephanie, any any thoughts on this? Yeah, it's such an interesting question. Um, I think for me, part of what really stuck out to me in the art was the almost transformative moment of embodiment in terms of when she leaves the gallery when she's fired and that kind of um the role of excrement in that and the role of her kind of behavior um i thought was really interesting from that corporeal standpoint um and again in terms of like the transformative powers and kind of her kind of statement as the artist especially with the um, re-watching reva on the videotape um I definitely I think kind of I don't know like for me it reminded me of the fallen man um kind of putting that into a realized perspective I thought was really interesting um I'm not sure what else I could I could say um, but yeah it's definitely um a really interesting question something that I think you, you keep coming back to, even after you've read the book. Um, for me as well, it was kind of who inhabits the world of art and who participates in the world of art from that kind of financial perspective, especially and that like the tortured artist and that mythologized kind of role of art um, definitely gives you a lot to think about. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Sorry for, for putting you in the spot <laughs> like that. Um, so I think we'll we'll have to end here to vacate the room for the next panel. Thank you so much to um, all of our speakers for your fantastic papers today, and also um, to the audience for posing such thought-provoking uh, questions. I think this was an incredibly promising start to the conference, um, and I feel very grateful to um, uh, having been able to um, chair in this panel. So um, thank you to all of you for participating, and I hope to see you around uh, during the next few days. Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to our um, third panel of the day uh, of our really um, 
fruitful so far contemporary women's writing and medical humanities international online conference i apologize for the slight delay in starting this panel we've had a few technical difficulties um but hopefully everything should be uh working now so firstly um uh this is our panel on narratives of labor i do have uh unfortunately we have one member of the panel who is not able to be with us today and that is claire archibald um but hopefully that will give us slightly more time at the end for um a discussion um of um this really interesting topic um we're also having a slight change to the order of our speakers so we're actually going to be starting with kellyanne Mm. Um, Kalyan mm, is a visiting assistant professor at the University of Pittsburgh. Her book project, Wounded Writings, Joy Bousquet, Hervé Dubert, Violette Leduc, Simon Veil, analyzes how the text becomes a tool for survival when violence and suffering alter the body. Alongside Todd Reeser, she's currently co editing a special issue of Simone de Beauvoir Studies on situating masculinities. Uh, Kalyan's paper today is entitled Marine Life. Innovations and Reproductive Futurities. Take it away, Kalyan. Thank you so much, uh, Catherine, and thank you for uh, organizing uh, this wonderful conference. Um, ben and Becky have been doing such a wonderful job, and I'm going to share my screen. As I noticed that there were four speakers, I kept my presentation really short, uh, but it's okay. We'll give more time for discussion at the end. Um, Okay. Can you see it? Um, okay. So in her writings uh, against reproduction, Donna Haraway states that making kin in multimodal, multi-species, multi-situated practices has never been more urgent. She expands on the neologism kinovator a person who makes family in non-conventional ways into kinovations, ways of kin making that are not limited to Western family nuclear apparatuses, heteronormative or not. As the sixth mass extension draws near, Haraway thinks that babies should be rare, nurtured and precious, and kin should be abundant, unexpected, enduring and precious. Some child-free feminists feel strongly that in order to be responsible global citizens and preserve the Earth's resources today, they need not to have children. Studying this standpoint through environmental humanities and health humanities sheds a new light on queerness and technologies of reproduction, past, present, and future. Following speculative fictions, decentering the experience of reproduction from the human body, today I will examine two filming examples of marine life on the issue of reproductive futurities. My two examples of marine animals that allow us to think about queer reproduction and parenthood are taken from Lucille uh, Halilovic's Evolution and Olivier Babinet's Poisson Sex two works that mix horror and poetry to enhance our affect about human reproduction and animal extinction. Taking the starfish in evolution and the axolot in poisson sex, I argue that thinking about animals in a way that goes beyond the metaphor, that is a phrase that is applied to an object to which it is not literally applicable, or the allegory, an image that is interpreted to convey a hidden meaning, contributes in crafting a more inclusive world in regards to reproductive futurities. Animals are, animals are often used to identify human behaviors and characteristics. In De Sexes Innombrable, uh, Thierry Oke takes the example of Miss Wawa in old happy family games to reveal the monstrous side of sexual binarity that encloses young girls into a future made for pleasing others and submitting to the male gaze. Anthropomorphic animals are often used to reinforce binary stereotypes, just as scientists seek a biological substrate of sexual orientation. During the Manif pour tous in France from 2012 onwards, the tautological slogan, une fille est une fille, un garçon est un garçon, has been chanted to stand up against la théorie du genre, a misconception of gender studies in their multifaceted aspects. Also, 
see this questionable snail that was chosen as a mascot. Anne Foster Sterling has distinguished five different sexes in uh, sexing the body and explained how two rodents, the rat and the guinea pig, have contributed in crafting the notion of sex as applied to human beings. During these scientific studies, masculinity and femininity became mutually exclusive. Foster Sterling claims that science is not made in a bubble, but that scientific discourses on the sexual traits of rodent in the 70s have been articulated in the context of gay and feminist movements and often challenged by them. If it is the case, the contemporary context of uh, French feminisme génital uh, that is defined by Camille Froidevaux-Métry influenced by phenomenology, as uh, indicated by Manon Garcia, Sarah Ahmed, and Iris Marion Young, calls for different animal models to think about human predicament today. Contemplating marine life immediately conjures up new patterns of family life, and our tenderness is intensified by the fact that these animals are often on the verge of extinction. The pregnant seahorse has been claimed by the hashtag seahorse dad, for trans men who carry their children. Penguins share parental duties, including the incubation of the egg, and they could inspire humans to revalorize domestic labor and childcare. The same could be said about the male clownfish, the main uh, caretaker of the eggs. Taking the animal size contributes to decentering and decolonizing the concept of family. Taking up Donna Haraway's make kin, not babies, I will examine sterility as it is related to life after the human catastrophe and attempt to reproduce in this context, creating ties outside of ancestry and genealogy. Lucille Hazi Halilovic had directed two long feature films, Innocence and Evolution, both depicting a utopian society of women close to nature. In Innocence, young girls live in an enclosed forest and are mentored by female teachers to dance like butterflies. In Evolution, young boys are kept by mermaids for the gestation and the delivery of a new generation. Nicola is a sickly young boy living in the sea, by the sea with his mother. One day while swimming, he sees the body of a dead boy with a red starfish at his waist. He tells his mother who goes diving and brings back the starfish, but she tells him that there is no body there. Later that night, his mother brings back the body and the other women gather around it. Later in the film, we learn that the women are not the boy's mother, but some sort of mermaids with suckers on their backs who gather near the sea for reproduction season and who are using young boys to carry their young. The horror unfolds when Nicola is given an ultrasound in the hospital. To his mother's joy, a fetus heartbeat appear. After surgery, Nicola awakens in a tank in restraints and sees two babies inside the tank with him. Evolution could be viewed as a grim illustration of Donna's Haraway's essay, The Promise of Monsters, which asks the questions, who speaks for the jaguar, who speaks for the fetus, in the context of deforestation or abortion. Focusing on the fetus assimilates the mother as a mere milieu an environment for the cell's development and ignores the woman's agency and right to choose. The female society exacerbates this maternal and fetal conflicts to consider the young boys' bodies as a benevolent environment for transplanting their female offsprings. Reversing the process of human reproduction, the medical surgery is associated with the clinical space of the hospital, yet it is closer to pollution and care. So here we see um, the women and the boys by the beach and the nurse. And this is a screenshot of um, the impregnation at the hospital. Joseph Jenner writes, the generative ritual of the film refers to that of seahorses, the female depositing their eggs into the male's abdominal pouch where they are fertilized and the fry are expelled after the eggs come to term between 10 to 25 days. Evolution depicts a colony of young boys with the potential for rebellion, carrying the legacy of Peter Pan's lost boys, the survivors of Lord of the Flies, or even sharing an affinity with wild things. However, the boys are meek and docile, believing that they have caught the ordinary illness of puberty 
thus embracing the order of things. Jenner adds, contamination and hygiene seem to coexist in evolution, generating an eerie register as new life is created with care, but not a life that is germless and sterile, but instead abject and filthy. In a humanist sense, the film is about the contamination of the human with the non-human. In this context, medicine is not aimed at healing, but as commodifying the little boy for reproduction. I would argue that by including the monstrous hypothesis of a parasitic reproduction, the film hints at a post-human future that could include vulnerable bare life, in which the prefix post would entail a reflection about what makes us human. The social structure in the colony are bare and the minimally demarcated spaces symbolize broken units that all lack something. The square houses stand for monoparental families, the rocky shore for a herd of children without girls, the hospital has patients and nurse, but no doctors. In this context, the starfish symbolizes the ontological castration of young boys who are reduced to model organisms for the mermaid's reproductive procedure. Nicolas' body in the water tank could be assimilated to the mutilated starfish he finds. Eva Hayward has written about the starfish self-healing capacities as a new kind of becoming following the cut that could be applied to trans bodies, the cut being a site from transformation and agency. Starfish can reproduce asexually by fission with part of a ray becoming detached and developing into another individual. Following crypt theory, Robert McGrew would decipher the fertile wound as a queer form of embodiment. Hayward claims that the cut reveals that the body is not a pure, coherent, and positive integrity. The incision troubles our understanding of male and female and forces us to look beyond duality when considering evolution drives. She also asks an epistemological question about the attitude towards the animal. When do metaphor and metonymy ripple into one another? Is the analogical device of likeness, like a starfish or like a woman, too clumsy a rhetorical device for the kind of poetic and material enactments of transsexing speciating? The animal asks similar questions in Poisson Sex by Olivier Babinet, a poetic reflection on the impossibility of fatherhood. In the near future, in a, void, devoid, in a world devoid of marine life, Daniel, Daniel, a shy biologist, dreams about having a baby. He begins to nest, decorating a room for his dream child, yet calculating that there is almost no chance of meeting a fertile and willing woman in his small town. At work, his team tries to encourage two rare but ordinary small fish to reproduce in the laboratory. Daniel finally agrees to try online dating. One day he discovers a poisson à pâte on the seashore. In fact, an axolotl, a Mexican salamander who lives in fresh water and is used as a model organism by scientists studying regenerative biology. In Life of a Pest, comparing different approaches to the axolotl, Emily Wanderer explains how biosecurity is understood in different ways in the United States and Mexico. Biosecurity refers to protection against disease. In Mexico, biosecurity refers to threats of life more for, to threats to life more generally, including those posed by invasive species and biotechnology, such as genetically modified organisms. In the world depicted by poisson sex, there is no more marine life, no more children. The world is in danger, devoid of hope. Thus, natural reproduction does not exist anymore, and babies have to be created in labs through technological means. Wanderer's inquiry remarks that scientists studying axolotl often identify with them and redraw boundaries around the community predicated on the recognition of connections between humans and non-humans. And here we could think of Harry's plead, one way to live and die well as mortal critters is to join forces to constitute refuge. Daniel keeps the axolotl in the fish tank in the baby room. This charm precipitates sudden turns of events. He meets two women in a row, but they are unable to help him realize his dream of fatherhood. He matches with his boss on the app and she invites him to give her some sperm and to leave the rest to her, crushing Dan Daniel's expectation of starting a family. 
he befriends Lucy and like a bird, in an attempt to seduce her or to convince her to conceive a child together, he shows her around the house, proving that he has he prepared to become a father. However, Lucy does not want to have a child. The axolol used in poisson sex has a pink hue, which denotes the fact that it has been conceived in captivity, used as a pet or a laboratory species. Axolot exhibit neoteny. They reach sexual maturity without undergoing metamorphosis. These salamanders can reproduce and survive in the form of a smaller larval stage, which is aquatic and requires a lower quality and quantity of food compared to the terrestrial adult form. So here I have put two images, one of the, the young um, axolot or the axolot in captivity and the axolot as um, it is in uh, his natural environment. As in Julio Cortazar's famous short story, Axolot, in which the narrator feels he became one after contemplating some specimens at the Jardin des Plantes, Daniel becomes akin to the Axolot. In a way, he has not reached sexual maturity and lives in a transparent tank, stuck in his dream of fatherhood. He is also commodified by science, he is symbolized by the lab female boss, treated like a specimen and reduced to his simple reproductive cells. His attitude towards the animal also frames his aborted quest for a child. As a biologist, he keeps it in a tank, but in a bedroom. And at the end, encouraged by Lucy, he releases it in the ocean. By the way, salamanders live in fresh water, but who knows what will happen in the future. The axolotl reveals the challenges of establishing kinship in the context of extinction. Reproduction is assimilated to regeneration and the plasticity of human biology. In Changing Difference, Catherine Malabou has written about the axolotl as a model to consider the notion of plasticity, as opposed to the Hegelian phoenix, who is reborn with the same shape, or the Deridian spider. A trace appears in the web of text as a difference. The phoenix is reborn from its ashes while remaining eternally identical to itself. The salamander is mortal and reconstitutes itself in an incompressible difference with itself. The limb that grows back never looks the same as the one that was lost, although it is perfectly identical structurally. Regeneration is therefore not a reconstitution of presence, but rather a regeneration of difference. Here to recover implies a finite survival, a momentary resource. The regrowth does not annul finitude, rather it is one of its expression. She adds, the paradigm of the salamander is not only irreducible to the structure of sublation or dialectical resurrection, it is also reductible to the paradigm of tissue. The salamander does not allow itself to be entirely caught up in the folds of the text. It heals by erasing writing. The salamander is elusive. We can think of other examples of elusive animals, from legendary deers to Moby Dick's whale, which transform the human protagonists in their quests. And it tends to erase the wound in the recovery process. In poisson sex, the axolot, who is not a poisson, hints at a new pattern of resilience in crafting a becoming that would be aside expectations of futurity and deliberately à côté or queer. The originality of both films also reside in the treatment of children. In a dystopian future, the child is not a figure to protect at all cost and does not hold the key to a better future. Rebecca Sheldon defines the child standing in the place of the human species, coordinating itself's passage into the future through the promise of one more generation. Yet the child figure emerges bound to the very forces of non-human vitality he has forged to contain. In this talk, I have argued that non-human organisms contribute to define multi-species model of regeneration and present the dark side of the cyborg as a human animal hybrid. Hybrid. Alison Kafer writes, the feminist task is not to plot some escape from technology or to map our return to a pre-industrial Eden, but rather to contest for other meanings of or other relations with technoscience. Unusual animals reveal that our metaphors or tropes or analogies have histories and consequences. In the case of the two films on parenthood, animals should be apprehended symbolically but also textually, considering the peculiarity of their organisms. Following Haraway's call for thinking in a tentacular way along nets and networks and not a sphere, 
and investigate biology as reconfiguring relations between human and non-human life. Placing the human on the animal continuum gestures to entanglements of legacies that would include all forms of life on the planet and a fertile compost to generate more kin in lieu of babies. Thank you. Thought I unmuted, but I hadn't. Thank you so much, Kellyanne. That was really, really fascinating. Um, yes, lots and lots uh, to talk about um, uh, in our Q&A later. I realised that in the, uh, the panic of our technical difficulties, I forgot to audio describe myself. So um, just uh, for what I should have said before, I am a blonde, white British woman in my late 20s with glasses, wearing a red cardigan and a white top. Um, Kellyanne, I don't know if you want to audio describe yourself as well, because I forgot to do that at the beginning. And <laughs> Yes, so uh, I am a small Asian uh, and French uh, uh, woman uh, in my 30s. And for the sake of this panel, I am wearing stripes, wearing stripes. <laughs> <laughs> Very appropriate. Um, thank you very much. Um, okay, so moving on to our next speaker, we are going to be hearing from, uh, let's just get Eloise Ducato. Um, Eloise is a PhD student in cultural studies at the University of Aveiro in Portugal. Her investigations go from the visual arts, film and painting, to society, feminism, migration, language politics regarding the Occitan, with insights into literature, uh, specifically fairy tales. Um, and today's paper is entitled Pregnancy by Julien Blancras in Utero and Andrea Grills Cherubino. Uh, Eloise, if you are there. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you for the presentation. The presentation is um, about pregnancy in. Uh, Julien Blangras in Grand uh, Cherubino uh, from Andrea Grill, and also journalist, a French and writer and French journalist. And uh, Andrea Grill is an academic, uh, sorry, researcher and a writer. She's Austrian, but uh, she has lived in several countries as a um, in the Balkans and in Italy. Uh, so my presentation uh, is about two authors who are under understudied in in the academia and also in in a pedagogical way in school books. I I've never found um, references or extracts from the texts. So far about uh, Julien Blancras in Utero. This is an autofiction, or we could say a note between autofiction uh, memoirs or an autobiography text, because um, this book is this book is between different um, genres. So um, because it's uh, literary, but also uh, like a testimony. And uh, also an essay because of the anthropological reflection about pregnancy from um, father and mother perspective, but the originality of the text. Um, first of all, it deals with the, his own experience as father for his first um, child, child, child. Um, his wife is pregnant and um, so he yeah he deals with the, his self reaction and the reactions at um, at work and um, he replaces its uh, attitudes in a historical way and uh, an international way to to show that certain pre um, pre prejudices in in France 
would have uh, no comprehension in other in other countries as Asia or as America. And um, an originality um, at the beginning. He so he explains um, his wife make makes a test to um, to know uh, if she is pregnant or not. And uh, yes, the um, the contrast between the the size of the white um, stickets and the the great novel, so the great event of um, of a baby. So he shows how yeah the announcement of a new life depends yes on medicine depends on on a simple object that the the wife alone um, tests and then he uh, the first one even for him he, he hasn't experienced it with uh, on children then he 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 nuances this uh, experience because at the same time, there's the more, most banal um, history of the world. So because the, yeah, the, since the prehistory, millions, millions of men, billions of men have lived uh, this, um, <laughs> this, um, this, this event. So it's like, um, the for, probably the most commu commune um, element with with all human men. Um, then we have uh, reflections with um, with yes yeah, um, lots of reflections about uh, freedom, how freedom will be endangered by by pregnancy for his wife. So she she can't uh, eat lots of traditional aliments, but uh, also for the the whole family. So um, for the day to day uh, life, uh, for, um, to track uh, the baby, um, to receive familiar. Um, Subsidence, and also he receives um, an official document because um, it's not the case in other countries, but in in France, the the embryo so before the birth, the baby is sure is already has been already registered at the administration, and so the, the parents receive an official document, you will be responsible for a baby. And so it's like, um, for the author, it's like a sign of end of yours. He, for him, it's like, it's like um, a raptor. Maybe the, um, the second raptor of, of his life uh, after his own uh, birth. He yeah he became an adult through the the birth of of um, of of his um, child, which be um, which be uh, which be ah which is um, a boy. We we learn it uh, at the end. Thus. Uh, then freedom is also endangered uh, at. At work, his wife um, and he um, work in the creative industries. She so he's a journalist and she's um, in in a television emission. And so the the reaction uh, at work is um, ah another one. It's um, her first um, child and. Uh, 
her colleagues uh, said, um, don't make greetings or compliments, but uh, sees this first uh, first events for the family as a repetition at work because yes, other women were confronted with um, too many em employees for the, the company um, have been confronted with this um, event. Um, and um, freedom is also endangered for yes for the the future father who is a journalist and who who is a reporter. So the other books of Julien Blangra, um, especially about his journeys in in the whole uh, in the whole world, but especially in 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 few visited zones, for example, in the Middle East, so in zones uh, that are considered or dangerous or, um, or that are analyzed mostly uh, geopolitically, but not um, anthropologically or um, socially. So the, the, this pregnancy, is also for him a question, should I reorient my, my work? Should I, should I change um, my, maybe my, my destinations in the, in the future? For him, uh, he wants to, he would like to, to continue his, um, his professional way, but his wife, is not um, that doesn't agree with um, this opinion we, that she considers as irre irresponsible. I haven't uh, precised, but the wife is always known la femme, the wife. So it's uh, very particular. He he never. Um, sees her name or um, familiar um, nickname or my wife, my femme, no. Imra always la femme. So um, most probably to, um, to, to draw um, a distance from the reality and so not to be and called in a too autobiographical way, but more in an essayistic way. And yes, he doesn't write um, an autobiographical pact as theorized by Gérard Genet. He and he does he doesn't he doesn't precise at the beginnings as um, that. Um, the story uh, is a um, pure fiction or pure, or that the, the seated figures are pure, um, pure imaginary fig, uh, figures. But yes, through the, the the whole book, we yes we we see the 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 relationships with reality and in the um, verse of the book, so in the third, uh, third uh, first page, uh, it's known as a journal de grossesse d'un futur père, so as a diary of a pregnancy of a future father, but uh, we don't have uh, time. Um, chronological indications about um, um, days, like in, in a traditional diary. We have naturally temporal indication, like um, four months or during uh, three weeks. So, but inside 
inside the, um, the sentences, not above or not um, at the end. Then um, he, so he analyzes um, pregnancy from yes an inter intercultural way because of his uh, work as a journalist. And so uh, he explains also the, the influence from certain countries on other countries. For example, it's uh, yes, um, a small paragraph that the inhabitants of the um, Iceland of Bellona in the Salomons thought that the pregnancy was um, a gift from the gods and not as the fruit of the of a sexual relationship, and that the European missionaries in a supposed civilization civilizing uh, way informed the in the the native inhabitants of this island that is that yes it's. It's yes um, a result of um, physical uh, relationship, and so that he explains that the pregnancy has um, yes has been uh, has been uniformized, and so maybe uh, fewer. Uh, yeah, had, has lost uh, its um, diversity of um, interpretation and of, yes, of, um, of conservation for, for children after. Um, another um, reflection is about his desire for the, um, the child, or the child. For for his wife, uh, it was um, a desire um, that that is beyond biology and, and culture. He considers that um, this uh, this desire was a fusion of both, or um, um, unfortunately, like, I think we've come to the end of. Uh, Eloise's time because we do need to make sure that we've got enough time for all of our panelists to speak today but thank you very much for that really fascinating talk Eloise um, and uh, we'll now turn to Adriana who um, we have had a few technical difficulties earlier today but we hope we've fixed them I'll just give uh, Adriana's uh, introduction. Adriana Paramo was born in Galicia, Spain uh, in 1985. She is a filmmaker that counts with two internationally awarded short films as a director and with more than five years experiencing, sorry, five years experience producing corporate branded and indie films. She's also the co-founder of the Galician Film Forum, an organization that exhibits films from Galicia, Spain, in the UK. Uh, she's at Royal Holloway University doing a PhD exploring documentary practice and gender. Her first year's project, The Stronger Experiment, uh, explores how patriarchal structures affect the characters seen on the screen and has been presented as a four video channel installation at the Los Angeles Film and Video Poetry Symposium in 2020. She is now working on her thesis project exploring how to subvert the social construct of the pregnant experience on the screen. Sounds absolutely fascinating, I cannot wait. Uh, so hi, I'm Adriana, I'm in my late 30s. Uh, I'm wearing glasses, I have very curly hair, and uh, I'm wearing a salmon pink blouse. <laughs> and I, my, yeah, my nails are uh, color green. And I'm wearing a ring, a very ring, big ring. So I have to start by saying that I am really sorry, but I've been having lots of technical problems. Uh, so uh, with the video and also with Zoom. So I'm gonna try to share my screen. If not, we have a backup. Um, and so I'm gonna present a video essay called Making Visible the Invisible. 
it lasts almost for like nine minutes. And then I'll just make a few comments on why I, uh, I'm making this video essay. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna try share my screen. No, it's fine. Oh, the average labor for a new mom is 26 hours. It doesn't pop out like it does on TV. It's going to be fine. Oh, oh my God. Oh, oh my God. God. Oh my God. Is, it, is everything fine? Get a cab. Get a cab. Get a cab. Conocí a la actriz Iria Piñeiro cuando hacía su obra Anatomía de una Serea, basada en las experiencias de violencia obstétrica por las que pasó durante y después del parto. Me acerqué a ella para grabar su proceso creativo, pero lo que me encontré iba a cambiar el rumbo de mi investigación y de mi vida. Yo hasta ese momento no me había planteado nada acerca de la maternidad, solo que era algo con lo que yo no me sentía identificada. Pero grabar su obra hizo que empezase a ver la maternidad de otra manera. Sentí por primera vez que tenía información y que era una realidad diferente a lo que nos dicen que debe ser. Escribiendo este, este guión, siento como María Lago, la poeta, empezamos a, a hablar de, de cómo son los partos, cómo somos en las películas, eh, la idea que teníamos de pequeñas y cómo son realidades. Entonces, parece unos graciosos que este momento, en este momento yo debería, debía significar un parto de película, exagerado, con gritos, con apelaciones a las virtudes diferentes, buscando películas en internet, a tope y está, que no venga película entera, pero esta escena de un parto que da peli un lío embarazoso. Aquí entra un colega. ¡Para aquí! Ahí en Sinan llegó un espejo y ves lo que me contaba antes. Toda lo que a, a, a vulva repetida, depiladísima, depiladísima, todo es así muy, muy aséptico y muy bonito, sin un pelo, sin, hasta creo que no se ve ni guano. ¿Por qué pasa esto? ¿Por qué el parto da asco? Porque vivimos en la permanente dicotomía, es decir, o sea, la teta que tú ves pornográfica, que te da placer, con la que te masturbas, es la teta insoportable, asquerosa, que alguien se saca para, para dar un bebé. O sea, hemos crecido viendo que el parto y vivía, que, por, que, que además no es muy lejos la muerte también, es una cosa que no mancha, que no es sucia, que no, no tiene nada de fluidos, que no es animal, que no... O sea, es todo, es, es absolutamente absurdo, quiero decir, eso no es la vida. 
si la imagen que tenemos del par de una sociedad viene construida en gran medida por lo que se nos dice en las películas, ¿de dónde vienen estas representaciones? Entonces pensé en cómo se había representado el nacimiento más famoso, el de Cristo. La iconografía de la Virgen es muy variada, reflejando los estilos artísticos y los contextos históricos y sociales de cada momento. Pero al representar el nacimiento, en ningún momento se muestra a la Virgen pariendo, o gritando o haciendo aspavientos, tal como sí suele pasar en las películas. Pero encontré que estas representaciones ya dejaban fuera elementos como cortar el cortón, como retirar la placenta, que el cine también ha excluido sistemáticamente. Desde el punto de vista teológico, estaban como las dos, las dos vertientes, los que decían que, que había parido con dolor por su naturaleza humana y que esa era una manera de transmitirle la naturaleza humana a Cristo, que tenía la doble naturaleza, ¿no? humana y divina, y otros que decían que no, que, que había parido sin dolor. No conozco ninguna imagen donde aparezca la Virgen eh, María pariendo con dolor. Y todas ellas aparecen eh, pues tumbada, reposando, y mi percepción es que lo que se está representando no es el parto en sí mismo, sino es el después del parto. Se me hace difícil pensar que esas imágenes, las más conocidas, las del nacimiento del niño, que además pues la Virgen está muy contenida y no sufre nada, puedan tener alguna influencia en esa imagen que tenemos eh, hoy en día a través del, del cine. Creo que tiene más que ver, pues con todo, como te comentaba antes, con toda esa corriente troidiana de plantear que, que, bueno, pues que las mujeres eh, realmente pues, sufrían miseria y entonces en relación a eso pues, surge esa idea de que el momento del parto pues, es un momento totalmente eh, pues eso, de, de pérdida de, del control. de una imagen explícita de parto de la Virgen María, la usó la vicealcaldesa de Valencia para felicitar la Navidad. Sandra Gómez, buenos días, ¿qué esperabas? ¿Qué ha pasado? Yo creo que es una imagen bella, una imagen realista de lo que supone dar a luz, de lo que supone traer vida al mundo y que pone en papel ¿no? el esfuerzo, la fuerza de las mujeres. ¿Has recibido amenazas de muerte? Esto sobre todo lo que ha reflejado es que tenemos que hacer mucha pedagogía, ¿no? Sobre el proceso del embarazo, el alumbramiento, la lactancia, del papel que ejerce la mujer, y que no es algo de lo que nos tengamos que avergonzar, que tapar, que ocultar, sino que es algo que también tenemos que visibilizar. Lo que pasa es que no puedes volar porque no eres Superman y esas cosas, pero en un parto lo que ocurre es que estás alimentando algo sobre, una, sobre un vacío de realidad. O sea, no hay una cultura establecida sobre lo que es un parto de niñas. La información que tenemos de cómo se desarrolla ese proceso de, de parto, de ginecología, etc., es un asunto muy privado del que no hay fuentes escritas. Es decir, casi no tenemos ninguna mujer que hable en primera persona de qué es lo que pasa. O no está escrito o está escrito desde el punto de vista de un hombre. Grabar anatomía de una serea me cambió como mujer. Empecé el proyecto para captar con mi cámara algo tan intangible como el proceso creativo de una actriz. Pero conocer las experiencias de Iria Piñeiro hizo que me cuestionase la imagen que tenemos del parto en la sociedad. Y acabé por querer visibilizar una realidad de la que muchas veces se nos da una idea equivocada. So, I'm just gonna uh, talk for uh, a few minutes, hopefully less than five. Um, so the video essay I presented, it does not intend to be an exhaustive compilation of all the films that have portrayed a pregnant woman or paintings and sculptures that have represented a Virgin Mary. But the images I selected are samples of how these have been mainly tackled. However, there are portrayals that have tried to subvert the patriarchal and colonized views, such as Gauguin's painting, The Birth, in which he presents a black Virgin Mary uh, visibly tired, or, well, the painting that I presented on the video essay by Natalie Leonard, uh, and in films, the Monty Python's Meaning of Life uh, from 1983, or more, more recently, the, a French film, Enormous, uh, by Sophie Letourneur, 
uh, which these two films are critics, they are comedies, they are parodies, and they are uh, critics to abusive obstetric practices and the infantilization of women during pregnancy and labor. Um, and especially I would like to mention a project, uh, it's a documentary called The Invisible Organ, presented by Andrea Kim in 2020. This is a documentary about the kaleidoscope, a new medical device developed by Duke University that enables women to conduct uh, self-explorations of their own cervix. And, uh, and I just love the title of the documentary because uh, the title of my video essay is Making Visible the Invisible. And Andrea Kim titles the documentary The Invisible Organ because uh, it's the cervix usually is something that we don't talk about and that we don't even see. Um, so I like this documentary because it mixes the medical image with the cinematic image. And I think it is uh, probably a way forward in opening up this uh, conversation. Um, so uh, the, for me, the main point of the video essay is um, uh, addressing the need of talking about these issues because uh, uh, the, the two women that I interview, the activist Jesus Arricoy and the um, uh, professor uh, Irene Gonzalez, they both talk about that there is a need to, to know more about pregnancy, about labor and to have a culture around it and even the um, on the TV clip that I show the mayor of this region in Spain, um, she explains how she thinks, because she, I don't know if it's, uh, if you all got it from the clip because it's kind of cut it, cut it down, but she received death threats because last year she used this painting uh, to as a Christmas greeting. And she was saying that this only uh, makes visible how important it is to talk more about what labor really is and to, to be more knowledgeable about it. So um, my contribution to this conversation is uh, this video essay and other video essays that I'm doing around the subject. And I believe as Professor Grant says that the video essay, uh, she says, about the video essay. We are not only producing new knowledge, we are expanding what that might be. And I think it does involve affect, feeling, emotion. So this was exactly what happened to me when I was filming the theater play Anatomy of a Mermaid, because I started the investigation uh, around the idea of the creative process of the actress. And then I felt so engaged with the subject um, that I, it, it, immediately shifted to something more personal. And I think what it did it, it's that uh, the actress, Silvia Pinheiro, she said to me that she went into labor at 38 years old, feel, feeling ignorant about her body and enabling abusive situations without even realizing. And I felt enraged that something like this could happen to me. Um, so I, I, yeah, I realized that I was not just simply filming, but I was starting a personal journey. And this is why I included myself in the video essay, uh, just as a way of uh, me <laughs> reflecting on all, on all these themes as well. So for me, really the main point is to stress the need for uh, more portrayals that are subvert uh, the, the image that has been perpetuated around the pregnant body. And also the need to acknowledge that we need to talk about these themes and make them visible. So yeah, that could be it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, you had 30 seconds left as well. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, huge round of applause. Um, that was really, really fascinating. Um, so those are our three presentations that we've had. Um, I'd like to um, open up the floor <laughs> to questions. Um, but while you are thinking of your questions, um, I might just uh, just dive in with the first one. Um, and actually, it's a follow up for Adriana, um, but also it, it will link into Callianne's as well. So I wanted to ask Adriana a bit more about the, the play itself that you filmed. So and actually the fact that it was um, I've already forgotten what, what it was. The something of the mermaid. The word mermaid jumped out at me because it linked into Evolution 
from Kalyan's talk. So could you tell us a bit about the play and why she's chosen the mermaid figure and, and, and why, yeah. Yes, um, a lot of people ask me about this when I talk about it. I know it's not your work, obviously, but... Yeah, yeah, no, you, no, it's, yeah. it's absolutely fine. It, uh, I also asked her, like, why this title? Um, she said that when, well, I don't, I don't explain it on the video essay, but I do have other video essays that talk about the play. And um, she, basically, she, uh, uh, um, they did an episiotomy on her and uh, the stitches were left open and this caused her pain for more than two years. But nobody told her, oh yes, like, you know, the stitches are open and this is why you are suffering all of this. It took her two years to find out and to have like, a, like um, um, an official um, um, notification about this. In any case, while she was suffering so much because the pain was like uh, more and more over the months, she started feeling uh, like she couldn't move her legs. Uh, she was afraid that she couldn't behave normally in, the, in her daily uh, life. So she started feeling like a fish. Um, that, yeah, for her, that was the feeling like not having legs. And, um, and that's why she then came up with the title of Anatomy of a Mermaid. Um, and also just to comment a little bit more, um, she actually did the play because she was discouraged from uh, making a, a, a lawsuit against mm -hmm. the medical health system. So yeah, she, that's how she overcame the pain. Wow. Um... Gosh, that's that's obviously that's a really awful story, but it's a powerful story. And I think I think the well, what I take to be an important message of of your film is that we are sharing these stories. Mm. That's really important. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so if I might pass on to Kalyan then, what you think the significance of choosing the mermaids is in the film Evolution? Because I know you spoke a lot about the significance of the starfish, but if you could say more about the the mermaid figure? Um, I think it, it is actually linked to the problematics that Adriana was uh, talking about that the mermaid can really um, symbolize the reification of the woman through the male gaze as it is um, a mythological creature mostly constructed by the male gaze. Also the, the most famous mermaid character is silent um character so um here i think that the horror of um the the film is that they gain some kind of agency by exploiting um what is most precious to um to humans that is youth and i think white youth even though um actually the the um, it, the problematic of race is not present in this movie, but I think that um, the director thinks about it because in the first um, movie, um, Innocence, um, she chose to to have an Asian uh, protagonist in a white world. And so the fact that here the white boys are, are instrumentalized to further research on reproduction is a kind of... Um, an inverted world because of course, black women were instrumental into crafting um, uh, knowledge about the reproductive system. And actually I had a question for Eloise because in Utero, um, the, the, you said the writer um, refers to the wife as la femme, that is um, uh, l'épouse, la femme, or like the wife, but also the woman. And I was, I was wondering what, if you did not find it a bit essentializing as la femme, as just the, the incubator for, for the baby, or how did you read this, the, the, the la femme as a, with a majuscule? Uh, yes, you're right. Uh, I was stunned at the beginning. And in my opinion, yes, it's, it's a little ambitious from the author to choose La Femme as, as his book could uh, correspond to 
um, the pregnancy of all women and it's um, also yes he tries to um, generalize experience to to get abroad the um, empirical um, yes the empirical way to um, to reflect yes um, in a more cosmopolitan way uh, i think it's um it's too generalizing and also la femme as um, la mère or the la maman uh, or la future mère la future maman would be also more um, adequate to the book because la femme it's it can undermine that all uh, femme or women become yes become mother um, one day um, or that yes motherhood is intrin intrinsical to 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 womanhood also he he has a chapter about the the desire the non desire of certain women not to have a children, which is a desire that is not so um, meditated, so that is also from, yes, in certain societies, and most societies not so um, accepted, not, not so um, considered, yeah, that is considered as egoist. And he, he explains um, the, the, the disagreements between um, feminists, be between and also between ecologists, because this non-desire um, yeah, can have um, yes, lots of um, lots of reasons. But uh, yes, um, La Femme is um, Yes, it's a bit uh, yes essential unsocializing, I think, and yes. Um, thanks for that. Uh, I think so. You you mentioned ecology just there, uh, Louise, and it's um, it's brought to mind some of the in Kalyan the the films you discuss. I think what's really fascinating to me. Um, is how there's sort of these other political questions going on behind the questions around what it, pregnancy and reproduction and all of these things. So, for example, um, in Evolution, you said that there was a lot of this idea of sort of contamination and, and that still that you showed us of, at the, you know, by, or by the shore and kind of, I wonder, is it making a point about how we curate the planet and that sort of thing and um and i wondered as well about particularly the choice of the mexican axolotl um when the film is the is the film set in the states or is it set in france i didn't quite uh, it's set in france it's set in normandy okay all right so there isn't quite that same implication if it were set in the united states but but I think the sort of there is that kind of I don't know the idea of of boundaries as well and political boundaries and and how you think the these films speak to those other political questions. Yes, it is. It is a fascinating question because as I think those two are low budget films, uh, they they avoid talking about any kind of catastrophe. Um, so it's very subtle and quite subdued, actually. And it, by just reframing the, the relationships between human and animals, there's some hint at something happened, um, that the hierarchies are different. Um, but we don't really know if it is like a nuclear um, event or pollution event or just extinction. Um, Yes, but I think it's definitely present, like the ecological um, concern. 
Hmm. Um, I mean, I can I can keep I can keep going. I I find this so fascinating. But I I I'm I think aware. We have a of question it. in the chat. Oh, so we do. Thank you, Kalyan. Yes, I didn't see that pop up. Um, uh, are you happy for me to read it out, Minji, or would you like to read it out yourself? Oh, I, I think I can make it myself. Thank you. Thank you for great um, presentations. And I just love that discussion. Like I'm a medievalist, so I don't know much about the like modern depiction of um, giving up birth. But is it kind of kind of like personal question too? Like I know that some women, like many like women, actually they go had to go through C sections, but I think they're not presented that much in media or dramas. So I just kind of wondering whether like Adriana, it's like you have seen any case of this C section or any particular way of representing um C sections in your research. Um Thank you. Uh, I'm not particularly studying C-sections, but um, the film Prometheus uh, from 2012, um, there is like this scene usually comes up uh, because the, um, the protagonist, she, I th yeah, I think it's Prometheus. She performs a C-section uh, to herself uh, to kind of get the alien um, uh, from her. Um, but uh, sometimes, because when I interviewed the professor, she was telling me how C-sections are more documented than other things. Uh, like she's, ex she's, a, she's expert in like ancient times um, sources. So she, she was telling me how there are, uh, there is like written information on how they usually, they, how they did. Uh, C-sections. Yeah. yeah, that's um, very interesting because I think like, I think C-section of course is from the um, seizure, but we never ask what happened to the mother of seizure. Of course she died and until very late, um, very recent, like women have to be died. Like they, the reason they go had to go through C-sections actually they are died or they are to be died so but not many people are work, like talking about the mothers so i was kind of wondering how women are represented in the c-section not the health providers not the babies or not the families but the women themselves yeah, yeah of course sorry I'll, I'll just finish but um this remind me because you are asking like how it's represented usually it's also there is some work around the idea that women in um, giving birth uh, in, are represented as monsters. <laughs> um, and especially in like, of course, in horror movies as well. Uh, so because this is linked to Prometheus. Um, so yeah, anyway, um, that's also interesting, like how the mother is usually represented as a monster. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that question, I think. I think that is really interesting because when we think about, you know, what what is birth, what is labour, it, it means so many things to so many different um, women, and and as a fact as well, I I wonder if it's something that has been discussed. This is making me think of a, a discussion from a previous panel where we were talking about um, about trans men going through the menopause and and Kalyan you mentioned the how the figure of the seahorse has become an emblem for for trans men who have carried children and how it actually it's making me think of um it's making me think of the Arnold Schwarzenegger film where he is pregnant to Emma uh thingy's child like it's it's a mad premise and I'm trying to think if they that must be a C-section, obviously, because there's, yeah, I can't remember what it's called now, though. No, not Juno, not Juno. No, it's Arnold Schwarzenegger is the, is the, is the man who is pregnant. Um, it's, it's not twins, because that's the Danny DeVito one, but no, no, Juno's the one with the, Ben, you're way off. Um, <laughs> yes, it is, it's a very interesting film, but it's, it's really, bizarre and I wonder how how if a film like that could be made today as well and and sort of the 
anyway, I'm going way off where I, where I was starting with this. Um, but so yeah, the, the figure of the the seahorse um, and how trans men who are pregnant and labour and I wonder junior sorry that yes that was it um uh I wonder how whether this is even a question that that you you can answer on this panel I'm not sure but whether there will be do you know what I I see Daria's got a hand up and I think that's where we're going to go um yes so Daria what's your question we'd love to hear from you I've gone too rambly Okay, uh, do you hear me? Okay, uh, yes, uh, thank you for your presentations. And uh, like, I have a question for Karina. And uh, thank you in particular for your uh, reflections on this connection between human, non-human reproduction and ecology. And uh, resonates very much with uh, my own research. And um, I, do, I have actually two questions. One is more specific and another is like more broad. Uh, the first one is because you mentioned that this uh, the, uh, this animal images uh, they like co contribute uh, to the uh, queering uh, to the rethinking of the parenthood of the family model, and so I was wondering uh, if you engage uh, directly with the field of queer ecologists with this framework. And another question, it's about um, Donna Haraway's uh, th reflections, Don, uh, Donna Haraway's work uh, that you mentioned, uh, like this um, idea of making kin non babies, making kin non population, because I work uh, with similar issues in Italian context. And in Italy, now, uh, currently, there is almost a renaissance of Donna Haraway because, uh, like, her works, especially this one, Staying with the Trouble and also the making kin non-population, they are translated and they are highly discussed and promoted precisely because uh, of your engagement uh, with the topic of the like new types of family, new types of uh, parenthood, uh, because uh, in Italian context, uh, this uh, uh, the idea of Haraway of these multi-species compost communities of the multi-species like families uh, Acts, uh, it, it acts as a counter narrative to the uh, common discourse in the Italian context, which is, of course, a traditional family and heterosexual fathers, uh, mothers, and children. And so that's why it's like the Haraway's, Haraway's works, it's so uh, like um, it, it's so disgusting and it's become so actual for the Italian schools. And so I was wondering, is it? Um, is it quite? Is it something the same in the for the francophone literature for French literature? Like, um, so I was just uh, because uh, since you mentioned these Haraway works, I was wondering if there is some something uh, similar to what uh, we can see now in Italy. And thank you once again for all of your presentations. Thank you for this. Amazing question. Um, uh, it will be really interesting to see um, um, the comparison between France and Italy um, in, in this context, because they are both uh, Romance uh, tradition. Um, of course, there is this um, reference to queerness and ecology. Um, and I I don't know if I if we have the same definition of queer ecology, but I think that how I, I work in queer ecology is seeing how um, the human is possibly reframed when it, especially in representation of the monstrous and excess and um, how affect um, could contribute to um, making the idea of the human evolve as well. Um, so we, we have the horror of the, the giving birth. So this character is very extreme and um, hysterical and crazy, but there is also the horror uh, of the woman who does not want to have children and uh, the figure of the witch and um, uh, the unnatural woman. So I think that animal studies to an extent 
can also enter in this dialogue um, to, um, to examine the, the, the instances in which these women are, are just represented as devoid of humanity. Um, and I think that it might be interesting to, uh, to turn to um, first person narratives of women uh, or mothers um, in that case and how they imagine themselves to be. Uh, and uh, I remember in, I gave the talk uh, in the session of when it was the year long seminar and it was about uh, women giving birth and um, describing themselves as reptile. Uh, so, so I, I'm thinking about that and, um, yeah, so I, that's, that's when the animal comes into play. Also, of course, um, there, there is some resistance to that, um, with, um, political movements advocating with, um, uh, le mariage, um, um, le, what, what was it like the, uh, the Manif pour tous, uh, which shows the snail as uh, an emblem, even though the snail is a, is a sexually ambiguous um, animal. Uh, but these people would say that it is not natural to have queer families. Um, and, and then th there are some people who really search for the queerness in nature. And of course, there's this example of the queer penguins. Um, so there is an instrumentalization of animals to a degree. Um, um, yes, yeah, so it is a complicated issue, uh, I think. But um, yes, I think that it is in, in, the, in, in the definition of what is human today or what is human reproduction today. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks for that question, that answer. Um, it's, it's just brought to mind, I know that there's a fairly recent, uh, I think it's French children's book, where it's about two male birds that find an egg and raise the egg together, like raise the raise the chick together. Like, so there, there is increasing use of the the animal kingdom to, to represent queer families, um, certainly. I am... Um, I, I thought perhaps we could, um, as we're coming to the end of the session, um, discuss maybe a bit more broadly a question that I think, Adriana, your, your film raises, which is maybe, why don't women talk about this? Do we have any ideas why? Because I think what's interesting, Kalyan, in, in the films that we've seen, in your films that you spoke about, is that we've got in, um, in Poisson 6, there is the absence of reproduction at all. So it's like it's it's about this, but it's it's not about it at all. That's that's the one glaring absence from the film. And in Evolution, it's the fact that it's the women that aren't having the pregnancy. Well, it's the mermaids that aren't carrying the children and, and having the births. And and Adriana, I, I felt like a big a big theme from yours is the fact that, well, yes, it's invisible. So outside of promotion through film, television how do we make this visible how do we make it heard how why do we think it is that women don't share these stories i i was just chatting to a pregnant friend recently and she was talking she is a pediatrician so she has a whole different concept going into her birth because she's seen she only sees the the labors when they call the pediatrician in which is when it's gone wrong so she's got this whole sense of what it's going to be like because she's only seen the things that go wrong and and i wonder yeah, just just more generally, what what we think about this absence of sharing. Um, to be honest, I think it comes down to patriarchy and the way uh, men have kind of like made the script, basically, um, because with um, it's, it's I I think it's kind of what uh, it is mentioned on the video essay, like the professor she says that and she's mainly referring to um historical um um information but she's saying that from the very beginning the women were not telling uh, how labor was 
but uh, so the so men were the ones uh, saying how, what was happening when they didn't know basically, uh, and this has to do with like historical reasons of how, uh, for example, the midwives uh, or women were kind of put aside, and then the the the, the role of the obst- male obstetrician mm-hmm. came in. Uh, so, and then all of this made uh, women feel insecure and it has to do with with obstetric violence uh, a way of infantilizing women and so you feel that you are wrong or, or they make you feel that and um Pine- uh, the actress Iria Pineiro she was telling me how you know she she wouldn't um that no no other friends of her told her like you know that these things could happen so she kind of found herself but at the same time when she found out that those things happen she didn't feel ready to share because she thought she was the only one so it was only when she started like researching online that she found out like oh wow like this happens to more people um, but I do think because I'm working on another project to make these things visible, and I think that slowly I think um, women are kind of realizing about this. And um, just recently in Spain, there's been like this year, there's been a proposal for a law to regulate obstetric violence. However, the um, the um, um, Called the Institute of Gynecologists in Spain, they said uh, that for them, obstetric violence doesn't exist. So when you have these discourses going on, it's difficult for women to, to speak up or to even talk about our bodies because as mm. uh, Jesus Arricoy says on the video essay, we've been told that we are disgusting. So I think it's, I think it's really complex, but I think it has mm. to do with all of that. Definitely, yeah, definitely. Um, uh, Linda, and I was going to mention your previous comment as well about Call the Midwives. Linda has just posted, there's a fascinating recent, fascinating recent book by a historian called The Imposterous Rabbit Breeder, Mary Toft in 18th century England by Karen F- Harvey, which is a fascinating story about the politics of birth. Um, and she also, Linda also posted earlier, because I, I believe from a previous panel, Linda is a clinician yeah. um, of some description. So she's got some know-how here from, from that side of things. Um, but she's mentioned that uh, some of the most popular TV series in the UK are about childbirth, for example, uh, One Born Every Day and Call the Midwife, which is set in the 50s and 60s. Now, I don't personally, I've never seen Call the Midwife, um, but... Uh, but Kalyan, you're a fan, I believe. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I, I wonder, um, I do, we are sort of coming close to the end of our time, but we were a little late in starting, so perhaps we can run over this just a smidge. Um, how, from, because I, I, I only know because it, it crosses over with my research that there has been one portrayal of an abortion, or at least a woman seeking treatment after her backstreet abortion on Call the Midwives, but... Um, how does Call the Midwives actually put, does it, does it portray the births itself? I honestly don't oh, know. Oh, yes. It does. Yes, it, okay. it, is, it is. That's why I watch it. <laughs> because I want to know more. Um, um, actually, I think you can also see Call the Midwife as a, as a long love letter to the, to the health service and all, the, and all the, um, the care that they provide uh, for mothers. So it is very particular to Britain, <laughs> I would think. Um, uh, but um, in France, definitely after Me Too, as Adriana was saying, um, there is more sharing of um, personal experience in the hope of forming a community and uh, with what Catherine Froidevometrie called the feminisme genital is that it, be- it begins from the anatomy and knowing um, the female anatomy. Of course, you know, um, such, a, such a feminism has... Uh, its defects as well, like uh, lack of inclusivity um, in some cases. But just knowing, um, and it begins with just uh, the the um, 
the event of getting the first period, you know, so um, just to sharing that and removing the shame of all that is uh, attached to the female anatomy, I think it's crucial. Mm. I could not agree more. Um, and actually, I think that's probably quite a powerful place to, to end our, our conversation today. But I just want to say thank you again to our three panellists um, for a really, um, I want to say fruitful, but it's, it feels kind of ironic to use that word when we're talking about pregnancy and things like that. But um, uh, yes, just really fascinating. Thank you so much to all three of you. Thank you. <laughs>